בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, Thank you everybody for coming out, ברוך השם, glad to see everyone. The, uh, we had a few uh, instances this, uh, with this event to put it together, ברוך השם, the, uh, the address had to be corrected the last minute, so I know uh, a few people are running late, but בעזרת השם, we'll learn a lot of uh, Torah together and some things that are going to change some lives, בעזרת השם. Tonight's show is going to be for the Refua Shlema and Atzlacha Rabba of Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Avi Mori David Ben Esriai, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahites that continue to watch us, continue to learn Torah with us, and all of you that have made the Mesirut Nefesh to come out here, Baruch Hashem. Some of you have come from uh, different uh, places, from California, from Ohio, from Texas, from uh, around different parts of Florida, Baruch Hashem. Shechem, 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 Kechem, that uh, you spend your time and effort and resources to come to Ashir Torah, uh, instead of all the other things that we can do in the world. So, I thought a lot about what, uh, you know, what to do this year about, because of course, you know, on one end, you could always do the same thing over and over again and give people the same chizuk. There's nothing wrong with getting the same chizuk. More emuna stories, more, uh, you know, musar that's going to help people uh, do tshuva. Even if you repeat the same thing 50 times, it's always beautiful when it comes to the Torah. But the same token as one of our bin, one of our, uh, you know, I guess uh, ways in, uh, in Kedusha has been over the years, of learning and teaching Torah is always to come up with something new. There always has to be something new. Why? Because the, the Torah is wider than the ocean. And there's no end to the amount of Torah that there exists in the world. Where literally if you spend 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for the next thousand years, reading, you're still not going to finish the Torah. Now, when a person hears such a thing, if he has learned Torah for many years, he says, that's an understatement. It's even bigger than that. When a person hasn't learned Torah, he says, nah, come on, he's exaggerating. It's too much. Nothing is that big. This is why it's very, very important for a person to know, if you hear something coming from my mouth, whether it's tonight or all the things that we've said over the years, whether I mention a source or not, I usually try to mention sources, but even if I don't, you can bet the farm and everything else that goes along with it, that it has a source. That it's not something I'm making up. I don't have any side business of conspiracy theories and making things up. The reality is that Rabotai Karim, out of all the things that we can think of, of what to talk about, what's better than to talk about the purpose of this world? Now most people think purpose of the world is what, you know, a lot of people, especially liberals, like to say, oh, unity. Let's all unite. Let's all unite. On October 6th, we were united. On October 7th, they murdered us. So it didn't really work out, this unity. They united, you know, in Israel, and then they murdered us for the unity. So obviously, unity is nonsense. And you say, yeah, but that's because they, uh, they're the enemies. No. The Nevi'im say, Me'arsaychu me'archivaych b'mech yetzehu. Your conquerors, your destroyers will come from within you. Meaning your worst enemy is going to come from within you. Your own community, your own nation. Sometimes even your own synagogue and your own household. It all depends how you build your house. Now one of the things that's become really the topic of discussion for anyone that is paying attention is that we have all found out between us, we all already knew. But it's all been confirmed in the last several days that the leaders in America, in Israel, pretty much everywhere in the world, are all involved in some type of immorality, whether it be adultery, pedophilia, and all types of filthy and disgusting things that the word should, that the, the ear should never hear and the mouth should never speak of. But when you have leaders like that, you have to question a few things. You know, this whole Epstein list, 
that is a constant topic of discussion so long as they don't tell you another rumor about some UFO that's going to take your attention or they don't tell you about some other thing that never happened but it's happening just to get your attention off of it the Epstein list that they're trying to give to people bit by bit like, like tweets 140 characters at a time why don't they just give you the whole list? Because perhaps if you knew the whole list, maybe people would start passing out in the street. Why? Who's on the list? Pretty much everyone that's anyone, in so many words, that's a leader, is on that list. Whether it be the Stephen Hawking's that couldn't move, couldn't walk, couldn't move his hands, had to communicate with his eyes, but yet this sick monster liked young girls. Young means underage. Or it's Bill Clinton, or it's the Bill Gates, or it's the other disgusting creatures that unfortunately are on the news anyway. But they're usually on the news for discovering things, for passing laws, for making speeches, for building things. But now they're on the news for different reasons. Now, if you would think, oh, yeah, but listen, this is the Goyim, you know, you know, what, what, no, it's not just them. In Israel, the same thing is happening. Leaders within the government and different major officials and leaders are being exposed for the same exact thing. It's not different. Meaning, the spiritual filth that's in the air right now, it's surprising a Kadosh who hasn't destroyed the world. Now, the last time that we were together and we had a live event with you guys, some of you were there, some of you weren't, we spoke about these issues of immorality, and Baruch Hashem had reached thousands and thousands of people from all over the world that really realized that everything that's written in the Torah, including the heinous crimes that you don't think are really common, whether it be bestiality, LGBTQ, or or all the other disgusting, filthy things that are out there, if it's in the Torah, there's a reason for it. It's not just for you to theorize about it, that this is what happened 3,000 years ago. It's something that's apparent, apparently, in our generation. And over the years, one of the main topics that we've discussed is the issues of morality, is the issues of Kedusha. Now, over the years... The Tikkun Abrit movie that we made has been the most effective, popular movie that we ever had. It's reached somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 million views across the different channels. I think the Spanish channel just uh, crossed 3 or 4 million views. The, the uh, Hebrew channel has millions of views. The English channel, literally 14 or 15 different languages, this film has reached many, many people, and anyone that's actually watched it from beginning to end, his life has changed. Her life has changed, men or women. But unlike that film and the hundred plus lectures that have spoken about this particular topic, where the main focus from beginning to end has usually been the consequences of immorality. The consequences of whether it be wasting seed, consequences of adultery, where it's better that, according to the Torah, it's better that a person die than, than cheat on his wife. It's better that a woman die than cheat on her husband, according to the Torah, according to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Instead of you saying yes, you should jump off a bridge, according to the Torah. Why? Adultery is forbidden. Now, obviously all of these heinous punishments are enough for normal people to say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. But what about if we're dealing with decent, normal people that live in an abnormal environment where it's simply not enough to know about the punishment? We've spent countless hours studying this topic. There's nothing else that I've studied more than this. We have a whole series of Jewish intimacy that discusses about the beautiful parts of kosher intimacy. Highly recommend it to any couples or anyone that's planning on getting married. And the series has already saved multiple marriages and helped many people, Baruch Hashem. 
But when it comes to the issues of Kedusha, usually it's just scaring people with the reality. Unlike what we've done over all these years with somewhere close to at least a couple hundred lectures, tonight we're going to do something a little different. We're going to talk about the greatest punishment of all, which is missing the reward. As bad as the punishment is, anyone that saw the Genu movie or the Tikkun Abrit movie, and some people told me they've already seen both of them 10, 20 times, they need it at least once a week, like medicine. Baruch Hashem, if that's your medicine, good. Better than that, then take your pills. Now, all of these things are good, but when it comes to this particular topic, most people don't know that as bad as the punishment is, the different chambers, the different losses, the biggest punishment of all is not getting the reward for being what's considered, according to the Torah, the purpose of creation. The reason why the world exists the partner with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, the reason why Mashiach will come, the reason why the Bet HaMikdash will be built, and countless other things that the average person does not know, even if they've learned Torah most of their life. Now, of course, before we get into there, we have to also remember that it's not just fun and games. So to give you a little bit of tidbit of some of the stuff that you're already used to, just in case... Nobody's going to think I'm turning soft. We have Rabotei Karim, our weekly parasha. Our weekly parasha, Parashat Vayera, introduces us to a couple of names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that you're going to hear several times tonight. Where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Vayedaber Elohim El Moshe, Vayomer Elav Ani Adonai, Vayera El Avraham El Yitzhak Ve El Yaakov, Ke'el Shaddai, Be'el Shaddai, Ushmi Adonai lo nodati lahem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, aside from the Shin Dalet Yud name that appeared to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, I'm also known as the Yud Kevav Ke, the Tachagrammatan name. These are different aspects of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're not going to go into the details of what each one means because that literally will take a lifetime. But nonetheless, you're going to hear these terms. These are all different aspects of Hashem. This is all different ways that HaKadosh Baruch Hu presents Himself to people miraculously, supernaturally, with mercy, with uh, uh, judgment. Now when it comes to judgment for the issues of immorality, the Arizal had a, his main Talmud, Rabbi Chaim Vital. And he took the teachings of the Arizal and put them into writing. And one of the, the most famous teachings in the world of Kabbalah, the world in, in, in the issues of mysticism, is Shah Gilgulim, the gate of reincarnation. In gate number 22, Rabbi Chaim Vital tells us about the many forms of punishment that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has, but one of them is reincarnations. In Hebrew it's called Gigul. Meaning that a person can reincarnate into lifeless vegetation, animals, or into a person. And almost the majority of people will not escape these reincarnations. Shem Yerachem. The reason is because a person cannot receive punishment until he exists physically as a body with a soul. Then once they, they reincarnate, he can bear and feel the pain and in thus atone for his sins. However, according to the extent of his sin will be the way which he reincarnates as vegetation or as an animal. Now, we've spoken about reincarnations in the past. I'm just going to give you a small tidbit before we go into the reward. Because like I said, once you hear the reward, you're going to realize it's worse than all the things I just said. Rabbi Chaim Vital's son, Rabbi Shmuel, also brings some chidushim here. 
And he says, a righteous person, as a result of his deeds and his mitzvot that he performs through eating and similar activities, has the ability to distill out additional portion from the level of the inanimate. Meaning that a person that's really righteous, that's a tzaddik, can actually help something that reincarnated into food. Or, which means that it can re- help the cow that he's eating rectify itself. Now who, who, can, who actually reincarnates into these things? A person can reincarnate into a rock, into water, into a plant, into a tree, into a cow, into a bunny, into all types of things you see on a screen usually. And sometimes eat, but not necessarily something you want to turn into. The Navi Habakkuk in chapter 2 verse 11 gives a couple of hints in the verses where it says the stone from the, uh, from the wall cries out or the beam of the timber shall answer. These are different hints of how the reincarnations go into a stone or into a tree. So who are these people? Now sometimes you're going to hear a reincarnation of somebody into something and then another time you can hear he's going to reincarnate into something else. For example... You've probably heard me several times mention the Gemara that says that someone that is a Jew that's intimate with a non-Jew has to reincarnate as a dog. She's tied to him like a dog. One of them is that the Neshamas actually connect and it takes a lot of effort to break the relationship. Two, it's also the punishment is that he has to reincarnate as a dog. But now you're going to hear something else. He's not only as a dog. So what does that mean? Is it contradicting? No. It means that... Everything has multiple layers of punishment, multiple layers of reward. There's never just one size fits all. You do good, okay, you just go to heaven and uh, good luck, enjoy yourself. On Rosh Hashanah, as the Gemara in Masirat Rosh Hashanah says, the books are open for the living and for the dead. Why the dead? The dead. Because whatever they left in the world continues to generate either more merits or more sins. And that goes to their account. If they opened up a business like one foolish person did in Canada and he decided to invest a bunch of people's money into the number one pornography company in the world. And he says he used to be a rabbi. He says he used to be a rabbi. Perhaps in Gainom there's rabbis, maybe he was one of them. Or he's going to be one of them soon. But he decided to invest and buy this company. Now this guy, after he dies, his punishment will never end. Why? Because such an entity, the sins never end. The sins never end. Because even if the company shuts down, whoever made a sin as a result of his product and it ruined his life, there's no way that he can go to heaven and the other people are in Gehenom. The same concept on the other end. When the Navi Shmuel was called to come back to this world by Shaul HaMelech, he went to an inappropriate source to bring back the dead. He went to witchcraft because he needed Shmuel to come back. Shmuel died. He needed to know to go to war, not to go to war, what to do. Shmuel, when he came, the Torah says, Shmuel came with Moshe Rabbeinu. Why did Shmuel come with Moshe Rabbeinu? Because Shmuel... Know that he's already finished this world. He's in Gan Eden. If they're calling me, this may be Yom Adin Gadol, the final judgment day. And I'm too scared of that day. Even though I'm in Gan Eden right now, I'm too scared of that day. That's a different punishment. So I'm bringing Moshe Rabbeinu with me. He can vouch for me. I followed the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu can vouch for me. He didn't know he's going to see Sha- Sha- Shaul. So the point being is that there's layers of reward, there's layers of chas shalom, the punishment. So if you see or hear things that are different, don't think it's contradictory, just know that there's multiple levels. In gate number 22, the Arizal says, one who is intimate with a married woman, that's not his wife. If he was at the time of the Sanhedrin, 
would be strangulation, death penalty of strangulation. But since there's no death penalty of strangulation today, what happens? Hashem punishes him in a different way. One of the ways that he's reincarnated into a grinding stone. A grinding stone in which wheat is placed and is ground by water and rotates the, mill, as the millstone. Some people reincarnate animals. So anyone that you see in that list of the Epstein list, don't be angry at them. You're wasting your effort because a Kadosh Baku will punish them a lot worse than you could be angry. So at the very least, spend your time and energy being happy, serving a Kadosh Baku, learning more Torah, helping people stop becoming uh, pedophiles and disgusting people. Those people, you can't help them. Why can't help them? Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev wrote in Likutem Aran Tanina that there are leaders of Shekel, leaders of lies that are put into the world, especially the generation before Mashiach, that have such arrogance that they feel the need and desire to influence the world to become more immoral. Their arrogance brings them to a position where they feel that they need to influence people to become more immoral, immoral meaning the stuff that you see in the world. Like the grooming that they do with little kids, and Disney, how it became a little center for pedophilia. You know, all of these different things. This is already in the Torah. Rabbi Natan, the Talmud of Rabbi Nachman says, people that have fell and committed adultery or wasted seed or made different types of sins, you can usually help them. But it's almost impossible if they fell from the arrogance to the immorality and the immorality made them addicted to money. If they're just addicted to immorality, usually you can help them easily. But if they're addicted to money and immorality, it's almost impossible to break that klipa. Usually you would think it's the opposite. Oh, you're addicted to money, that's easier. No, no. no. Once he's addicted to immorality and money, He's in a position of power, it's almost impossible to change. So rather than be upset of all the disgusting people that are constantly mentioned on the news, don't be. What you should be is try to see if you know somebody else that fits the description. Some people that reincarnate into animals are as follows. Someone who is an arrogant person can reincarnate into a bee. Others can reincarnate into water, where there's a malach a destructive angel that oversees that person, that neshama that's in water, and it wants to come out of the water, but he keeps it break, staying in the water. Rabbi Shmuel, the Ma'ashu, brings some chidushim that he adds to the Shara Gilgulim, and he says that he found this in the book by Rav Eliezer Alevi, Allah Shalom. And he says that one has that has relations with an animal reincarnates as a bat. One who has relations with a menstruant woman reincarnates as a female Gentile. Meaning he who lived as a Jew, Jewish man, he now reincarnates as a female non-Jew. His tikkun will, become to, will be to convert. One who has relations with a married woman reincarnates as a male donkey. Has to carry, has to get beat up by a stick all of his life get tied to a tree and he knows he's a human though he doesn't think he's a donkey he suffers the agony of the stench that the animals have imagine you know sometimes we take our kids or we bring some animals to the house it's fun for them to play with goats go feed some cows it's cute but one of the things that every normal human being notices unless you work on a farm is that the stench of animals is not exactly pleasing you don't want to eat there Imagine you sleep in that. Imagine a person sleeping in that 24 hours a day. That's what happens to a person who reincarnates as a donkey. One who has relations with his mother reincarnates as a female donkey. A male who has relations with another male, LGBTQ, reincarnates as a 
bunny or a rabbit? What's the difference? Why a bunny or a rabbit? Why just not a bunny? Why not a rabbit? Depending upon the sin, whether he has been active or passive in the relations. Every detail of Abu Tayyib Karim is already written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Nothing new under the sun. One who has relations with his daughter-in-law reincarnates as a female mule. One who has relations with a female non-Jew reincarnates as a Jewish prostitute. As I mentioned before, you're used to hearing reincarnates as a dog. Now you heard a Jewish prostitute. Why? Because he has multiple tikkunim. One tikkun is to be a dog. One tikkun is to be a Jewish prostitute. Why? You acted with promiscuity, will reincarnate you as something that's constantly promiscuous. Dogs obviously have no manners when it comes to their relations. They're known as a cursed animal. Even though they love their, their owner, they're still not a pure animal. And I don't have to explain the, the other. One who has relations with a stepmother reincarnates as a camel. With his sister-in-law reincarnates as a male mule. Stepsister to his father or his mother reincarnates as a stork whose companions will kill it. Not only is he a stork, but he has to be a stork that the rest of the storks kill it. And he gives you verses for each one of these. Not just like he just comes up with different things. For that one, for example, it's Vaikra, chapter 20, verse 17. Lastly, as an example, one who constantly looks at women. Up to now, most normal people say, ah, that's not me. Psst, I'm not going to be a mule. It's great for me. Not me. I'm not going to be a bee. I'm not going to be a donkey. I'm not going to be a camel. Up till now, every average guy is saying to himself, this is horrible. For him, for him, for him, for him. Not me. Why? I'm not doing all these horrible, horrendous things. Some people that are watching out there online, maybe say, oh, that's not so good. I don't want to be a camel. I don't want to be a camel. But this one applies to everybody almost. At some point or another, if they don't pay attention to their eyes. One who constantly looks at women, forbidden to him. Needless to say, women that look at men that are forbidden to her. All of this, by the way, applies to the opposite. Don't just think this is only a lecture for men. One who constantly looks at women that are forbidden to him, glancing at them, will reincarnate as a white vulture who can see farther than the other birds. Why a vulture? Why not a chicken? Why not a bunny? Why not a camel like the other guys will have some bunny friends and camel friends? No, no. He has to be a vulture. Why? Because the vulture has eyes. He can see a lot of things. You like to look? Now you're going to use your eyes for those things. But all of this, says the Shah Gigulim, is only if he did not do tshuva. All of this applies to someone who simply ignored tshuva and lived his life like a mule. But if he did tshuva, if she did tshuva, if she covered her hair, if she covered her body, if he covers his body, if he acts like a normal, decent human being, and not like one of the people on the list, then he has nothing to worry about. But that's not necessarily complete. Why? Because just doing tshuva is not just not sinning. There's also a tikkun that a person must do. And if he does the tikkun, there's no one greater on planet earth than him in all of the generations. One of the examples the Gemara gives us is Mar Ukva. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says Mar Ukva one day looked at a woman that was a married woman. But he looked at her, he didn't say anything, he didn't touch anything, he looked. But she was a married woman, forbidden to him, he got sick. Really sick. Horribly sick. Bedridden sick. Sick enough for the Gemara to mention it. So it wasn't a cold. For looking. One day the same woman, who again is married, 
has financial troubles, she needs to borrow some money. She knows that Ma'ukva had some money, he was rich. She comes to Ma'ukva. And she says, not only she needs money, but she wants to be with him too, even though she's married. If this wasn't a test before, imagine now. Ma'ukva knew the Satan is in his house. Satan is not, it's not like on TV. Satan is inside his house. This beautiful woman, he already thought about her. He already imagined. He's already in trouble for her. But now she wants him. And she's in the position of need and he can help her. Ma'ukva passed the test. Did not touch her, did not accept anything. He gave her the money that she needed to, to help her. But that's it. That's where it ended. Akadosh Baruch Hu was so enamored by him passing this test that from that moment on, he got healthy instantly. And from that moment on, when he would walk around, there was a fire, a spiritual fire on top of him. Now sometimes there are spiritual fires on top of some people that you can't see with the naked eye unless you're one of those people also. But how do you get to be such a thing? One of the greatest farim that's written in recent history is a sefer called the Brit Kodesh or Tarat Kodesh. Tarat Kodesh by Rabbi Aaron Rata. Rabbi Aaron Rata was a holy person. He must have weighed less than 100 pounds because he had literally sanctified his body to the point where he would limit even his consumption of food and drink. Everything, if it wasn't for the sake of heaven, he simply wouldn't do it. To such an extent that when he finished writing this book, each time before he would write, he would dip the pen or the writing instrument in a mikveh. He would dip in a mikveh and he would dip the writing instrument in a mikveh. Because he knew that in order to get these types of words into the world that we live in today, World War 17. After he finished writing this Sefil, had to publish it, print it. He made sure that not a single person that's involved in printing the book is a Pogem Brit, meaning everyone that had to be involved in printing this book had to be Tzadikim. Not only Tzadikim, they keep Torah, keep Mitzvot, learn Torah, no, no, but they had to be Shomer Brit. <laughs> Furthermore, even the equipment, the metal that you make the imprints on the uh, book in the printing press, he dipped those things in a mikveh. Now when a person thinks of some of these things, you don't really know the issue, it's, it's, it's a little ridiculous. It's a little overboard. I doubt they still do it today for his books that are printed everywhere, but the point being is, is that this is what had to come to the world initially. Why? Because inside this book, aside from telling us about all of the different things that I just told you, and many, many other things, he also told us the 80 ma'alot, 80 different rewards that a person that has a brit kodesh, meaning that either has never sinned or has done the complete tikkun, has done tshuva. The different rewards that a person will get. Some of these rewards are going to sound repetitive, but they're not. It's just simply different levels, different layers. We're not going to go through all 80 because that'll literally take a week and a half. Just to study for this shield took me about four or five days. But I will give you a little tidbits of a few of them. So you understand that all of the punishments in the world are not in comparison to the reward that a person is missing out on. As Chachamim tell us, as bad as the reward is, the, the, as bad as the punishment is, the reward is 500 times more. The reward that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives is 500 times more significant than the punishment. This is why Mar'ukva, who's mentioned more than 90 times in the Gemara. 90 times he's mentioned in the Gemara. If you're mentioned by name in the Gemara, that means that you were able to resurrect the dead. But he's also mentioned for his downfall. Before he became as great as he is, he fell. What? He looked at one woman. 
He didn't look at movies. He didn't touch anything like people do today. No. He looked once. But that's also mentioned. Why? Because our Torah is not biased. It doesn't just give you the good news. It tells you reality. Which means, whether a person has fixed it already, is still sinning right now, addicted to the sin, wants to do tshuva, regardless of what circumstance you're in. You're in a forbidden relationship. You want to be in a forbidden relationship. You're, you're not even sure what a relationship is. The point of this shiu is to tell you that regardless of where you are, you can fix it. And it's worth it for you to fix it, not just because of the punishment. Rabbi Aaron Rata mentions one of the first things that a person should know is that the entire world was created for those that are, have a pure breed. First sign, the first word in the Torah is what? Everybody knows, no? Bereshit. Even the idol worshippers know what Bereshit is. Everybody knows Bereshit. Regardless of whether they translate it right or wrong, Bereshit, everybody knows Bereshit. Bereshit, spelled Bet, Resh. No? Shin? You tough. Right? I'm sorry. Uh, Bet, Resh, uh, Aleph, Shin, you tough. Take the first two letters, Bet, Resh. Last two letters, You tough. What do you have? Brit. Two letters left, Aleph Shin, Esh, Brit Esh. HaKadosh Baruch created the world for the sake of the Brit. Gemara Masechet Haigah says, HaKadosh Baruch took black fire on white fire and wrote the Torah. What is HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Says that you have to cleave to Hashem. But Hashem, how can you cleave to Hashem? He's a fire that burns. Meaning the, 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 the symbolic fire is constantly mentioned. Fire of Gehenom is not symbolic, it's reality. But when it comes to overcoming the issues of immorality, if a person does not have fire in them, they're not going to pass the test. Why? She's too beautiful. He's too nice. He's funny. She wants. He doesn't. He wants. She does. You're not going to pass the test. It's too convenient to sin. That's the reason why a person needs to know the consequence. The fire, that's negative. But tonight we're going to learn a few things of the fire of the positive. Rabbi Aaron Rata says that some of these things that you're going to hear may not be rewarded to a person, not because he didn't pass the test and he's considered holy and everything else, but rather because sometimes the generation that he's in doesn't deserve to see such a thing. Doesn't deserve to see somebody that's walking around with a fire on top of his head. But he can be assured that at some point or another he will get that reward and he'll be surrounded by those types of people. If not in this world, in the next world. First thing is to know that a person that is protecting his wheat becomes a partner in a creation where the entire world stands upon the seven pillars that are symbol, symbolized by seven days a week, seven weeks of the Omer, Shabbat being seventh day. And therefore, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, the entire world was created and exists for the sake of the Brit. And thereby meaning that all of the angels and the upper worlds are destroyed each time somebody's pogem brit. Meaning, each time somebody wastes seed, each time somebody's committing adultery, each time somebody's in a forbidden type of action of any kind whatsoever, there's destruction even if he or she doesn't see it. She walks around immodest, people sin, she's destroying things that are beyond her imagination. Just imagine, you know, anyone that's old enough or still knows a little bit of history knows about what you know, America did about 70, 80 years ago, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, they're complaining about Israel throwing a few bombs at their enemies. They forgot they threw atomic bombs. Two of them. It wasn't enough to throw one. 
Until this day, there's damage from what they did. Anyone that saw some of the images or the films of Hiroshima and Nagasaki knows it was literally like massive destruction. Anytime somebody sins, she walks around immodest, t- does an action of immorality. He does, she does. Imagine that times a thousand. And that's just the first step. She got out of the house. By the time she arrived back at the house, three hours later. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that when somebody is, has the Brit Kodesh, they're not only a partner in creation, but they're literally protecting and empowering the entire world, both the upper and the lower worlds. When Am Yisrael protects their Brit, no nation or people can overpower them. The Mabul happened as a result of immorality. And therefore, the punishment was boiling water. And that's why someone that protects their breed, whether it's never sinning or they stop sinning and now they're doing tikkunim, they do tshuva, they learn Torah, they help other people do tshuva, they publicize these teachings, all of these different things that are part of the tikkun abrit, they're actually saving lives of Am Yisrael to the extent of holding the enemy nations helpless in their desire to destroy us. In so many words, if people believed in what the Torah says, instead of having all of these nonsensical protests and campaigns on the internet to give people playstations, they would have a campaign of Brit Kodesh. How to get Am Yisrael to do tshuva for this specific issue. Why? If Am Yisrael does not make the sin, they automatically become the most powerful nation on planet Earth without even a single gun. Why? Everybody becomes scared of them. That's just the second reward. Third, protecting Brit means each time that he doesn't fall. We're not even talking about he hasn't fell for five years. He stopped. Now he has, he's walking down the street, he's going to shul, he's going to work. Some woman that forgot her clothes at home walks by. She doesn't have arms or legs. His eyes want to look. His body wants to look. His mind wants to look. Neshama doesn't. He doesn't look. At that moment, says Rabbi Aaron Rata, that he doesn't fall. It's counted in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu as if he has fulfilled all of the mitzvot of the Torah. What does that mean, all of the mitzvot of the Torah? What does that mean, that all of the mitzvot of the Torah? That means that if you are not a Kohen, how are you going to make the mitzvot of the Kohen? You have 613 mitzvot. We always hear that. 613 mitzvot. You have to fulfill the mitzvot, but you can't. You're not a Kohen. You're not a Levi. You're not a woman. Or maybe a woman, but you're not a man. You're not young. You don't want to get a divorce. You don't want, you know, you already, you know, there's a lot of different mitzvot you can't do. You can't do certain mitzvot. Can't do korbanot. You have a better mitzvot, unfortunately. You don't look at her, you fulfill that mitzvah. You officially just made a mitzvah of the Kohen Gadol. You officially just made the mitzvah of bringing korbanot to better mitzvah. You officially made every single mitzvah in the Torah. And that's just one time. You don't look again, again. Now, of course, don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't go into a nightclub and say, I'm not going to close my eyes. <laughs> I'm close my eyes, guys. Why? says, somebody puts himself at risk, knowing it's a risk. In Shemayim, they put a stamp on his forehead. Say, Rashaw. He's wicked. Why? He's taking risks with his neshama. Who told you you're going to pass the test? Why have so much confidence in yourself? But if you pass the test, ooh, 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 you just made 630 meets foot. 630 meets foot. Who's better than you? The guy who got the foot reward. He's better. It happens to be the same guy. Why? Because the same reward for the same mitzvah. Dalit. He's rewarded with three special gifts from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Number one, he is promised... And again, everything I say he, counted as she. Everything is he, she. He's promised by a Kadosh Baruch Hu 
that he will see him with no barriers. You will see God. Not in this world. You leave this world, go Shemaim. But even in Shemaim, the angels don't see Hashem. No one sees Hashem. No one sees Hashem. The angels can't see Hashem. The chayot, the special levels of angels. Going to the Rabbah, Yad HaChazakah, it gives you different levels of chayot. Different levels of different angels. Called chashmal, called chayot, all types of wonderful things. Some of them are the size of planets, some of them are the size of little tiny things. Some you can see, some you can't see. Some have names. Michael, Gabriel. Some have names based on their mission. But they can't see God. But someone that's a Shomer Brit leaves this world with a Brit Kodesh is promised he's going to see a Kadosh Baruch Hu, with no barriers. Rabbi Aaron Rata says to him, Look, my brother, and he speaks in such a beautiful language, even though he's telling you about some things that, on the other hand, when the punishment, he says the same thing. You know, Genom, Kafakela, Ganeden. It's all the same holy mouth. He says, My dear brother, the love of my life and the light of my eyes, he calls us. Look at these wonderful things that Akadosh Baruch Hu wants to give us. You promise to see Akadosh Baruch Hu, can you possibly imagine such a thing? Not like these idol worshippers that think that some, some rock star with long hair died and, uh, and that's, now everybody has a picture of him. We're talking about seeing Akadosh Baruch Hu. That's just one of the things. Second, the holy neshamot from Shamayim unite with that person and impregnate his neshama. What does that mean, impregnate his neshama? We're not going to go into all the details. I'm going to give you a small little tidbit. Someone that learns Torah, does mitzvot, dedicates themselves, still has to deal with the capabilities of their body, capabilities of their mind. Meaning, if your IQ is 100, even if you learn Torah, naturally speaking, you learn math, you learn Torah, you learn other things, it stays 100. Okay, you learn a little more, maybe we'll go up to 102, 105. If we're really nice to you, want to make you feel good, we'll tell you it's 110. But that's it. A woman does tshuva, she puts a, a, a modest clothes on, eats kosher, sends the kids to... Uh, all types of yeshivot, everybody's tzaddikim. Nothing changes. She doesn't all of a sudden want to change her life and help the whole world. Right? Wrong. Why wrong? If a person has Brit Kodesh, he gets an answer reward. What is that? That tzaddikim that are already in Shamaim want to be part of your life. How can they be part of your life? What do you think they care about whether you light a candle for them? They actually like it, but it doesn't really change their life that much. They're already tzaddikim. The candle is more for you than it's for them. Going to the grave is more for you than it's for them. But how can you benefit? If you have Brit Kodesh, the tzaddik wants to be part of your life, and thereby takes a spark of his neshama and puts it in you. All of a sudden, you wake up on a Monday morning. You are IQ 105, 110, 120. You are able to read one daf gemara. Maybe it took you six hours. Maybe it took you two hours. You're trying. But all of a sudden, today, 10 pages, 20 minutes. What happened? Would you become a genius all of a sudden? All of a sudden, today, you don't, you don't even think about anything other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All of a sudden, today, you want to have some type of plan to help Am Yisrael do tshuva. All of a sudden you get this, these powers, wisdom, things that are not really yours. You know what that is? A tzaddik came in. And a tzaddik is trying to help you do more mitzvot. That way you both benefit. This is the second reward. Tzaddikim want to do what's called an ibu. Ibu is unite or impregnate the neshama as the Arizal taught us one who desires to become purified is given help by Shemaim how? 
the neshamot of tzaddikim enter that neshama and empower the neshama beyond the norm, beyond this level, and all of this is lost. All of this is lost if he wastes seed. All of this is lost if she wears something not modest. All of this is lost, gone. Third, the Shechina Akdusha, certain aspect of it, rests on this person. What does it mean when the Shechina rests on this person and doesn't leave? The only way to attain this Ma'ala is through Brit Kodesh. When the Shechina rests on him and doesn't leave, And he turns into a mishkan, into an altar of the Shechina Kedusha. Where the Al Shech Kadosh teaches that literally the person becomes a place that a Kadosh Baruch puts his Shechina. Where now we'll be able to get gifts, get dif- different types of spiritual and material gifts that are impossible to get if, not, if this doesn't exist. This is why Job said in the book of Job, chapter 19, verse 26, I see Hashem through my flesh. This you probably see in the Asher Yatzar posters. Usually have this verse. Through my flesh I see God. One aspect of it is that, you know, you see the genius in the makeup of the human body. You can see Hashem. Chachamim says, it's not just that. Because of your basal, because of how you treat your brit, you'll be able to see HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The neshama is empowered and capable to do tikkunim through Torah learning now and support, meaning someone that is holy and his, his brit is holy, is now going to be able to do a tikkun for his neshama, even from the previous carnations. If he's capable of learning, then through that, if he's not capable of learning, he can even support Torah and actually use that as a tikkun. Hashem will put a, a, a special garment, a divine garment on this person and call him Gibor, like Boaz, Palti ben Laish, and Yosef Tzadik. The Rambam says in Tarat al-Makshava, chapter 1, that all of the early writings and endless other sources testify that the ultimate purpose of creation is to cleave to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is impossible to achieve while a person is making sins, which create chitzonim. Chitzonim is a, in English, the only Translation is demons, but it's not really that. It's something a little different. When a person makes chitzoni, makes sins, it's impossible for him to cleave to Hashem and achieve his purpose. Tikkun of all of this, any type of sins, cannot happen if a person has continued to make sins. So if a person stops... Now they have to commit to stopping. The problem is that even if you stop, person continues getting thoughts. She's not dating him anymore. She left him. But she's thinking about him. He's bothering her. In her mind. Even though he cheated on her, even though he did horrible things to her, she's still thinking about him. Maybe he didn't mean it. No, what do you mean he didn't mean it? They made a movie. Maybe he didn't like it. What do you mean he didn't like it? He beat you up in front of people. Maybe... All the excuses are not normal, but she still thinks about it. Same thing on the opposite. He has private investigators, filmed her, committing adultery, but he's still thinking about her. Maybe she really really means when she says sorry. What sorry? Hamo. What sorry? She's bad for you. Still on his mind. Meaning, it doesn't matter whether it was a good relationship, bad relationship, she was nice to you, not nice to you. He's still, the bad thoughts... The forbidden thoughts always will rationalize the forbidden. 
People tell me all the time, listen, Rabbi, I don't know how to tell you this. Something horrible is happening to me. I said, don't worry, I heard it all. No, no, I don't think you ever heard this one. Try me, try me. Rabbi, listen, I went to shul. I was praying, but all of a sudden I'm thinking about Abu Dazara. And I said, okay, and? What do you mean, and? That's what happened. I said, no, what's the problem? He goes, what? It's not a big deal? No, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's horrible. But what's the new thing that I never heard before? He goes, no, no, that was it. I'm like, oh, that's almost standard. Rabbi, I went to shul. I was thinking about a woman I wasn't allowed to be with. No, what's the new thing? No, that's, that's not new. That's what happened all the time almost. So, okay, so what's, that's not nothing new. It's almost standard. Rabbi, I'm, I'm praying to HaKadosh Baruch I'm thinking about wrong things. It's, not, it's standard. Why is it standard? You know why it's standard? So long as you did not do a tikkun abrit, you're going to have garbage thoughts in your mind. Even if you're not committing the act. Even if you're not with her anymore. Even if you're not with him anymore. Anytime you pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, anytime you're trying to do a mitzvah, anytime you want to have peace and quiet and just simply connect to Hashem, all of a sudden you're going to have enemies enter your mind. Until now you wanted to do it. Once you did it, you, all of a sudden you don't feel like it anymore. Until now you were looking forward to go to pray to Hashem. All of a sudden you start praying, you're thinking about Yoshki, you're thinking about some idol, you're thinking about Buddha, you're thinking about money, you're thinking about all forms of Abu Dazara. You know why? Because you still didn't do the tikkun. You still didn't rectify the brit. You may not be committing the act anymore. But the damage is still there. So says the Ramban, so long as the chitzonima is still there, it's impossible to cleave to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's impossible to cleave to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And these confusions and strange thoughts disconnect a person from his roots. And the tikkun for all of this, in order to unify the holy name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is the tikkun abrit. Zohar, Parashat Lech Lecha, page 94a. The Rashid Chokhmah, in Shara Kedusha, Perek 17, says the one who merits to purify his breed according to the conditions that we mentioned, will merit that all of his thoughts will be pure and he will merit the cleave to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name, the Yud Kevav K1, the Tetragrammaton, whereby without Brit being pure, the gum that exists makes it impossible to cleave to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and fulfill your purpose. It's impossible for a person to have pure thoughts without having Brit Kodesh. Impossible. You can have a pure thought for a few minutes, a few seconds, but pure thoughts for an hour, two hours, a day, a week, that's only in the, in the movies. It doesn't exist. Why? There's a gum. There's a defect that has to be fixed. It's like having a highway. They spent five billion dollars on it. Only one problem with the highway. After you go about two miles, there's a hole in the ground, size of the equator. So in order for you to get to the other side of the highway, you have to fly. Is that highway worth anything? No. Does it have potential? Absolutely. It can be a fantastic highway. You just have to fix that bump. You have to fix that hole. And since HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I will not put all of the diseases of Egypt upon you, because I am Hashem, your doctor. I am Hashem, your healer. It means that through Shmirat Abrit, through have attaining Brit Kodesh, Akadosh Baruch Hu will heal this person's body and soul. Him and not anybody else. Meaning he's not going to send you a different angel. And therefore anyone, says Rabbi Aaron Rata over here, Anyone that has any type of ailment, doesn't matter what it is, must do a tikkun abrit for pram abrit. And when his tshuva is accepted, then the fulfillment of the verse, I am Hashem, your healer, will be fulfilled by a kadosh baruch Hu himself and not an angel, which will make a cure forever. Now a person hears this, 
If he's not sick, it's a guy that's pretty cool. If he's sick, ah, impossible. You know why? When you're sick, you don't think right. When you're sick and you're in pain, you don't think right. It's very tough to think right. That's why Job, for example, wasn't judged harshly for the things he said. He was tested with the harshest test that ever existed. But for the things he said, which are borderline heresy, in some cases were heresy, he wasn't judged as a headache. Why? He was in pain. He was in pain. Can't judge someone that's in pain the same way. Needless to say, a person that believes the Torah is 100% from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, believes every word of it, hears these words, says there's a cure for everything. How? Tikkun Abrit. Now again, tikkun is not just don't make the sin. Tikkun is fixing the thoughts, fixing the mouth, doing tikkun for whatever sins a person made in the past, or at the very least starting to do it. It's a process. But nonetheless, a person that does not believe in the Torah is complete, is not going to allow himself to do it. He won't sin with this, but he'll sin with something else. But when a person hears words like this, he says, so wait, you're telling me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, and I read this every day in prayer, I am Hashem, your healer. It's a pursuit in the Torah. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to heal me? From whatever ailment that I have? And it's not going to be an angel? It's not going to be Malach Raphael? It's going to be HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself? And how do I know it's happening? Simple. Sickness is gone. But how do I know it's going to be? Tshuva is accepted. If, it, if, if you're still not feeling well, tshuva hasn't been accepted yet. You haven't completed it yet. There's more work to do. More tikkunim to do. But it gives a person literally an instruction set, but also a test. How much do you really believe? Where's your line? You know, people believe to a certain extent. Theoretically, everyone says, listen, if Hashem says, uh, jump off the mountain, I'm jumping. Until it happens. Who doesn't say jump off the mountain? He says, go to Shio Torah sometimes. We go past. All of a sudden, we get busy. We get tired. So, a person that believes in the Torah sees hope beyond any doctor, any medicine that exists. And since HaKadosh Baruch Hu said it, the Ma'ala 12, the Ma'ala Shtem, this is only 12. Where HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, if not for my breed, day and night, the rules of the world, the nature of the world would not exist. It means that all types of positive blessings are dependent on the Brit, including rain, angels, the stars, the things of this world and the other, on the upper world. And that's why Yosef Tzadik merited to receive more blessings than all of his brothers. At the end of Sefer Bereshit, that all the 12 tribes get blessings from Yaakov. I'm sorry, in the beginning of, yeah, end of Bereshit. But we see the blessings that Yosef got were much more than the rest of his brothers. Why? Because he had Brit Kodesh. The blessings he got, he also got blessings on top, above. That's also why we say the uh, prayer of Amalacha Goeloti Mikola Mikol Ra. The Zohar Kadosh in Parashat Shlach, page 165, side A, says, Look at these holy words of blessings, worth more than gold, and paz. Paz is like a different type of gold. Zav and paz. Look at all of these holy words that will be given to one that has Brit Kodesh, where Kadosh Baruch Hu Shechina will protect this person. In front of him and behind him. And no man in the world will be able to harm him. And he says, my beloved brother, friend of my soul in the light of my eyes. Look at what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai heard in the cave from HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. Where HaKadosh Baruch Hu is glorified each day when someone protects their Brit. More than any servitude and any mitzvah or Torah learning that's in the world. Meaning, more than an Avrech learning Torah all day. More than someone that does chesed. More than any other mitzvah that exists, a Kadosh Baruch is glorified more when people are protecting their brit. To such an extent 
that HaKadosh Baruch Hu remembers him constantly. What does it mean HaKadosh Baruch Hu remembers you constantly? Literally means that. You say something, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is listening. You ask for something, you pray for something, you plead for something. You don't have to wait for Yom Kippur. The Brit Kodesh is the first mitzvah that our avot, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov received from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's why they were all called Tmimim, which means complete. And Shomer Brit will be called Tzadik. Like Yosef at Tzadik was called Tzadik only after he passed the test. Arav Galanti, in his Perush, called Nitzotze Orot Shem, says that one that has Brit Kodesh will become Hashem's vessel to bring sustenance and salvation to the entire world, both spiritual and material. With him himself being at the head, meaning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bring blessing. He wants to bring money to the world, let's say. Everybody's familiar with money. Everybody needs money. Even people that have money need money. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to do something. He uses vessels. You become a vessel. He wants to build a Jewish community. He sends you the money to do it. He wants to build some uh, uh, extraordinary kolel that's full of chachamim, he sends you the ability to do it, he sends you the, uh, the, the sustenance, whether it be money, or the talmidei chachamim, all of a sudden they're attracted to be next to you instead of going anywhere else. You become a vessel that HaKadosh Baruch uses to run the world. On top of all this, for those that do not have kids, or those that are still planning on having more kids. There's not a person on earth that doesn't want good kids. But what if I told you that there's a guarantee that you'll have a tzaddik, not just a good kid. Tzaddik. Someone that's a Shomer Brit. This is Ma'ala Chaisle, 19. On top of everything we just said, and I'm only giving you tidbits. This is not all of it, obviously. A person that, shomer, that has Brit Kodesh will merit to have children that will also have Brit Kodesh. And our tzaddikim. And as we learned from the Arizal, one of the, at least you know, one tzaddik will come from you. There must be a tzaddik, meaning there has to be a stamp where the world will be able to see the blessing upon you. A tzaddik has to come from you. What tzaddik? It's not like, oh, he's a good kid. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't beat up his sister. No. A tzaddik is something that, obviously, they grow up, they're all kids, they cause trouble, they jump up, they jump down, all these different things. But ultimately, a tzaddik comes to the world, it's as clear as day that this is somebody different. It's as clear as day that this is somebody different. Their brain works different. Their mannerisms are different. Their capability is different. Their achievements are different. Someone that has Brit Kodesh is guaranteed to have at least one of those. And on the other hand, someone that's Pogem Brit creates the children that are Rachman al and are connected to the other side. The Zohar Kadosh in Parashat Bereshit, page 8a, says the one that has Brit Kodesh will merit that Duma and the rest of the destructive angels in Gehenom have no permission to touch him. As it says in the Gemara Masechet Iruvin, page 19, that Avraham Avinu takes people out of Gehenom. Who does he take out of Gehenom? Only those that have Brit Kodesh. And the Ramban says, the one hour in Gehenom is worse than seven years of suffering of what Job got. 
Job got the most amount of suffering that any human being got in this world and stayed alive. But his suffering was for 12 months. Physical suffering, financial suffering, every suffering you could possibly imagine he had. He was so sick that the worms and maggots were coming out of his body, not even going in. All of his kids died on the same day, lost all of his money, was a multimillionaire. But the suffering that he had was for one year. You read the book, you cry. And the introduction to the book of Job, the Ramban says, forget about this being for one year. Time it by 70. 70 years of this is not equivalent to one hour in Genom. One hour is not equivalent. Holocaust, time 70, not equivalent to one hour of Genom. And trust me, if you know as much about the Holocaust as I do, Holocaust was bad, but not like Genom. But someone that has Brit Kodesh can walk around and get home and no one can touch him. Why? Duma, the chief general of Genom, not allowed to touch you. Can't do nothing here. Why don't you get out of here? Go to Ganeidon or something where good people are. I'm with Avram. Okay, fine, fine. I'm with Avram. Can't touch you. Why? Brit Kodesh. That was that one enough. That one, anyone that knows, either with the Holocaust or Genom, that's enough already. The rest of them is extra, bonus. Anyone see my film? Didn't get as many views. It's too scary. Even scarier than the other ones. It's called Chibuta Kevil. It's not just scary because of the gruesome nature of it. It's scary because of the reality of it. Number one, there's real life examples. Number two, Anyone that's uh, old enough has usually has gone to a funeral. Chibut the kever is horrible. What happens after a person dies is horrible. Someone that has Brit Kodesh, no Chibut the kever. No Chibut the kever. Why? The name of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, both the Yud K Vav K and the Shin Dalit Yud, are both engraved on his neshama. To the extent that his body doesn't become dust, doesn't need to be destroyed. He becomes like the tzaddikim. They look like they're sleeping. And ultimately when Mashiach comes, if he hasn't come during his lifetime, his body turns into like the light of the tzaddikim. It never has to be something that turns into dust and then resurrected. Anyone that watched that film, that's enough of a reason to do, uh, to do the tikkun. The Brit Kodesh brings protection to the entire world and all of Am Yisrael due to the heavenly emunah that it receives from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the merits, the merits to have joy in your servitude of HaKadosh Baruch Hu can only be if you have Brit Kodesh. Meaning, many times a person says, I like learning Torah, but I don't like praying. I like praying, but I don't like learning Torah. I like learning Torah, but I don't really like the holidays. I'm not really a fan of matzah. I'm not really a fan of the uh, this or that. It's expensive. It's not expensive. In so many words, he doesn't enjoy the mitzvot. In so many words, she doesn't enjoy the mitzvot. You tell her, listen, you're married? Yes. You have a head? Yes. Okay, you have to cover it. I don't like it. I don't like the way it looks. Oh, you don't like the mitzvah? You know why you don't like the mitzvah? Because it's impossible to like mitzvot until you did a tikkun abrit. Why? There's a gum. There's a highway. Spend $50 billion on it. I-95. Problem is, every mile, there's a hole in the ground. But not a hole like you could just drive around it. Hole like you have to fly over it. So unless you build wings on every car, it becomes a useless highway. The reason why a person does not enjoy the mitzvot is because there's a gum. Somebody says, oh, come on, mincha, mincha. You're like, oh, again? Right there and then, you just stamped yourself, you have a gum. Oh, Shabbat's coming. Oh, really, already? Oh, man, I got work. Oh, you like work more than Shabbat? You have a gum. You have a gum. You have, you, have, you have a problem. You have to fix it. 
You have to fix it. You want to enjoy Shabbat? You want to enjoy Hanukkah? You want to enjoy Sukkot? Even if it's raining on top of your head in the Sukkah? Still be happy, one of those people, yay! You want to do that? Tikkun. So long as there is a pgam, there's little to no joy whatsoever in the mitzvot. A Kadosh Baruch Hu elevates his neshama above the tzaddikim who have already done big deeds. Now, everyone likes the topic of Mashiach. Mashiach comes. He's not going to come into a boring world. It's going to be some chaos. Anyone that has seen my shulim in the past knows chapter 38 of the prophet Yechezkel, chapter 14 of prophet Zechariah, talk about a nuclear and atomic war, all types of horrible things. One of the other things it also mentions is that the plagues that we're learning about right now in the Torah are also going to happen again. But it'll be much worse. The plague of darkness is not going to be for three days like it was in Egypt. But rather for 15 days. There'll be 15 days of darkness that will happen before Mashiach comes. Where many will die between the time of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David's arrival. And there will be great birth pangs before the war against the evil Armilus. We haven't had a lecture about Armilus. One day Bezat Hashem will do it. Who he is, what he is. And this will be 45 days before Mashiach comes. A time where Am Yisrael will be in the desert of nations. This will be a time of a lot of suffering. Someone that Shomer Brit will be saved from all that suffering. In so many words, you can make it a, you can imagine being in some type of bubble where none of this stuff affects you. How? It's not my problem how. HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. Don't use your imagination because HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't think like us. Hashem will save him after the resurrection of the dead. Meaning, if he already died, time has come for Mashiach. 40 years later, there's resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead sounds great, right? Resurrection of the dead is scary. Why is it scary? Because after, during that time, resurrection of the dead, it's called Yom Adina Gadol. After this, is something called Yom Adina Gadol. What's Yom Adina Gadol? Everyone that's ever lived is judged again. It was so, it's so scary, this final judgment day of everyone. It's not, there's, a, there's multiple judgments. There's judgments every day. There's judgments on Rosh Hashanah. And really there's four Rosh Hashanahs per year. We have one coming up. Rosh Hashanah for the plants, two Mishvat. Rosh Hashanah. You guys don't think it's a big deal? The special tikkun of certain people that are in Gainom right now that are only allowed out of Gainom on Tubishvat. No other time. Meaning, he finished his sentence. Finished. But it's not Tubishvat. Has to wait on the side. No, no. Three more months. Yeah, but I finished. Finished, finished. Not the time. The station is the station. Shah Gilgulim tells you different months, different things happen. Different reincarnations happen. Meaning, he has to reincarnate into something. It only happens three different months during the year. He has to re reincarnate into something else. It's a different set of three months during the year. There's a system. There's a mechanism. There's a method to everything. But aside from all of these judgments, the four during the year, the ones every single day, the ones when a person dies, the one when a person is at risk, the one when a person, when Mashiach comes, the one at the resurrection of the dead, there's all these different judgments, but then there's the ultimate judgment. It's called Yom Hadin Agadol. And everyone, including Moshe Rabbeinu, are scared of this day. When Shmuel was brought down by Shaul, like I mentioned earlier, he thought it's Yom Hadin Agadol. He was scared to death. He brought Moshe Rabbeinu with him. He said, Moshe, tell my, I followed the Torah. Look, look, I told you what I did, right? Even though we didn't live at the same time, Moshe, you saw what I did, right? You saw from Shemaim what I did. 
Tell them, tell them I'm okay. Tell them I'm not. Shmuel, Shmuel Navi. Shmuel Navi, the Gemara says Shmuel Navi was like Moshe and Aaron together. He was scared to death. He thought it was Yom Adina Gadol. You know who was not scared of Yom Adina Gadol? Someone who's a Shomer Brit. Someone that has Brit Kodesh doesn't have to be scared of Yom Adina Gadol. If somebody completed the Tikkun of the Brit, a Kadosh Baruch Hu protects him from that day too. He'll be part of a Kadosh Baruch Hu's renewed world in the seventh millennia. Where a Kadosh Baruch Hu destroys this world and renews it. One day, Bezat Hashem, maybe we'll do a shiur about that too. Only people that have Brit Kodesh will exist. A person with a Pekama Brit cannot unite with the Shechina. Cannot even be considered a valid witness in a Jewish ceremony. Because the Chitzonim that he creates constantly are confusing his mind. And he cannot even have Kavanah when he says Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. On the Echad he can't have Kavanah. He thinks about something else. Or he thinks Chash V'Shalom Acher. Acher is other. Or he can't think straight when he says Avta Hashem. When you love Hashem. When he says I love Hashem he's thinking about money. He's thinking about his car. He's thinking about he has to pay the electric bill. Yeah but you just said well, you loved Hashem. With all your heart. And, yeah oh yeah I did. I said I love the Shem. Oh, I did it. He forgot what he said. He started the prayer. Shema Yisrael, he finishes Birkat Amazon. Why? Because of all this problem. You want to fix it? Tikkun Abrit. He's able to elevate the Shekhinah to even higher levels. To such an extent, HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes pride in him. And he's given a position of power. Even among Talmidei Chachamim. And he's given success in publicizing the Torah to the masses. He's given names like Chai, Gibor, Tzadik. All different types of names. Each one of them has different benefits. Shabbat and the Brit Kodesh are connected. Whereby it's impossible to welcome the Holy Shabbat without Brit Kodesh. If you don't have a Kodesh Brit, you cannot enjoy Shabbat to its fullest potential. And one of the reasons is because the extra Neshama cannot enter a person that has become a Brit. This is why it's customary for men to go to the Mikveh on Friday morning. Because going to Mikveh is part of the Tikkun Brit. So if you do Tikkun Brit, you go on Friday morning, it's like you start the Shabbat with a fixed Brit. Assuming you don't sin in between. And you don't plant the sin. Well, almost, I mean, there's many more. I'm just going to finalize with a few things and start taking some questions from you guys. I'm sure you have many that are re relevant, not relevant, but we can, like I said, we could do this for, for a year. The tzaddik would bleed Kodesh could enter Gehenom and take out other neshamot that are prisoners. Your cousin... Your best friend, your parents, whoever else that's over there. If you sanctify your breath, you can even get to a point where you can help them. That's why it says people like Tzadikim, Avraham Avinu, Rabbi Nachman Breslev, go to Gainom and save Tzadikim. It's not made up, it's true. But they don't just save anyone. And for a person, it's usually people that are connected to the root of his neshama. People that are connected to them, not just strangers. There are four klipot of tumah. They're called avon, mashchit, af, and, uh, and, uh, and chema. One of them that you mention every day in tefillat uh, arvit. These different names, but they mean different, they mean different things. They're also names of certain... Destructive angels, you could call it. Or klipa. These four are responsible for all of the tragedies and tribulations in the world. And the only thing that submits them, that overpowers them, is Brit Kodesh. Nothing else. When a person sanctifies his Brit, as I said... 
the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is written upon him. Where all of Hashem's ch- uh, legions above the heavens, the stars, the mazalot, the heavens, write down the names of all the people that have Brit Kodesh in order to fulfill their will. Why you've become, in essence, a partner in the creation. Even the ocean is willing to split for someone that has Brit Kodesh, as we see in the Pasuk Ayam Rav Yanos, that the, uh, the ocean saw and ran away. This is the Pasuk that it says about Yam Suf, where Am Yisrael got to Yam Suf, and the ocean didn't want to split. Why? The angel responsible for it says they're idol worshippers. Why should I split the ocean? Why should I split myself for them? But then, they brought the tomb of Yosef HaTzadik, the ocean got so scared it split into 12. Why? Because of the Kodesh of Yosef HaTzadik. There's a Tzadik that lived in Sfat. Not long ago. Figure less than 200 years, maybe 150 years ago. And he wrote a Sefer called Abat Aini. Abat Aini. He was one day on a ship coming to Eretz Israel. And as sometimes happens in the ocean, wind, storms, danger, but it's to the point where the ship is about to break and everyone on the ship is going to die. It's not like today where you can call somebody, helicopter rescue, none of that stuff existed. This tzaddik, the Baal uh, Bataini, says to the captain, raise me up to the, uh, to the uh, ship's, um, to the top of the ship. To the top of the ship. They didn't know what he wants. Everyone is crying, scared to death. They raise him over there. He gets over there. He opens his jacket. On the spot, the whole sea comes down. People were witnessing this. What happened? He showed the ocean his brit. He showed the ocean his brit. The ocean come down. Everyone's life is saved. So when Rabbi Aaron Rata mentions the Zohar Kadosh in Parashat Beshalach, page 49a, and says the ocean is willing to split for you, he's not trying to humor you. He's not trying to give you things, some entertainment. You can tell your friends. He tells you things that actually exist. Avraham Yitzhak and Yaakov cry over the troubles of Am Yisrael, especially times like right now, where all types of horrible things are happening. But sometimes even they do not have the strength, the spiritual strength to help us. So what did they do? The Ma'ala 53 says, they'll look for a tzaddik that has Brit Kodesh and use his merits to bring mercy to the entire world, to bring mercy to Am Yisrael, as if he's like one of the Avot, because he has Brit Kodesh. And Rabbi Aaron Rata over here, I'm sure he was crying when he wrote this, because he says, this is not just for anyone, but rather, they look for the merits of one who is zealous over Brit Kodesh to bring to the nation mercy from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, someone who is specifically who is zealous over Brit Kodesh and not like those who are scared or ashamed to spread 
the teachings about this and speak about these matters with Talmidim. Because all of the great Magidim, all the great speakers of the previous generations, would speak like, uh, speak about this and roar like lions over the Blit Kodesh. Even when it brought them attacks, even when it brought them pain. But what can I say? And to who can I say these words? As they will be mocked. But the truth is that the Zohar in Parashat Pinchas, page 213, Bri says, that those who are zealous for teaching Brit Kodesh are even higher than someone who has Brit Kodesh. And the proof is, when you compare Yosef to Pinchas, Yosef got a blessing from HaKadosh Baruch Hu where a hay was added to his name. Pinchas got a blessing from HaKadosh Baruch Hu where he added a yud to his name. A yud is higher. Lastly, it says that the ultimate driver and arrival of Mashiach is Tikkun Abrit, which is known as Midat Yosef. And while we see how the world is degenerating, the, is degradating, there's the degeneracy of people, especially regarding this manner, has gone to new grounds. How could this be where if this is the tikkun of the world, this is the purpose of creation, this is the way Mashiach is going to come, this is how they're going to build the Beit HaMikdash, all of this is going to happen, but we live in a world where everything is working the opposite. Immorality is standard in every house. As the Torah says, en bait en bomet. There's no house that has no, no dead body in there. The things that people used to keep in the closet, they've made public information. The leaders that used to protect us are the biggest criminals in regards to this issue at least. The ones that are supposed to make sure that there's morality in the world are the most immoral people that exist. The ones that know morality are afraid to, afraid to speak about it. Little kids are groomed to be promiscuous and spiritually deformed already at childhood. They teach them through different films and teachers and bring all types of mentally ill people to teach children. The teachers should never be teachers. The leaders should be put behind bars. Immorality has gone to the point where Sodom and Gomorrah is no longer jealous. We're pretty much equivalent. So how could this be the tikkun of the world? The Mashiach will come because of this tikkun. Bet the Mikdash will be built on this. How could it be? Says Rabbi Aaron Rata, don't forget, Akadosh Baruch doesn't think like you. Akadosh Baruch doesn't think like us. And he explains, while there's all this degeneracy, especially regarding this matter, don't think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought all of this for naught. It's intentionally this way. As Hashem gave the Samech Mem, meaning the Sitra Acha, the Satan, freedom to do what, it, to bring all of this right now specifically in order to make a last separation between the impurity, the zoama of the generation of the flood once and for all. Meaning, the generation of the flood is alive and well right now. Some will be fixed, some will be ultimately destroyed. And while immorality will reach new levels of degeneracy during this time, 
the merit of the few that are found among Am Yisrael that attain Brit Kodesh rather than be like the despicable ones who sacrifice their lives to look at despicable promiscuous women Rahman al Islam those few that protect their Brit and publicize this teaching will cause Akadosh Baruch Hu to see them and bring Mashiach due to their merit. Meaning, everything that's horrible right now is a clear indication the system is working perfectly. This is the way it's supposed to be. The only question that's left, which part of that are you going to play in? Which part of that am I going to play in? Which part of that are we all going to play in? Are we going to be part of the ones that fix? The ones that are part of the salvation or chas v'shalom? The ones that lose everything. Kabotai Karim. All of what I said is just literally a titbit, a titbit of the rewards that are given to someone that attains this tikkun, that achieves this tikkun. The first part is to stop the sin. Any immorality whatsoever, whether it's with self or with somebody else. If you are a Jew and you're with a non-Jew, you're a non-Jew, you're with a Jew, you're a male with another male, female with female, all of these things, all of these forms of immorality. You want more details? Watch some of my previous lectures. I figured I've given you enough food for thought. The key is to know. To do the tikkun is simple. One, stop the sin. Two, build yourself a fence, a spiritual fence, a mental fence. Not to sin again, which means constantly learn about this topic. Shurim like this, we have Baruch Hashem, many of them. So you constantly stay strong. Constantly get that Musar that's going to keep you at the right place because one Tikkun is not enough, one Shiur is not enough, one decision is not enough. It's a constant test. You may not have fell with her, but you may fall with somebody else. You may not have fell with him, but you may be somebody else. So you have to constantly fix it, even if you're married. Unfortunately, I have some women that tell me, listen, I'm married, but I'm thinking about somebody else. I'm married, but I'm talking to somebody else. I'm married, but I, this and that. Hashem Yachem. People don't realize this affects every single person that's alive. If you're alive, it affects you. If it doesn't affect you, you should check your pulse. Check your pulse. Perhaps you became an angel. So the first thing is to stop. Second thing is to build a self-offense which requires a spiritual teachings, requires all of the different things that are going to keep you away from it, but also the material aspect of it. Meaning, if you know that certain places, certain people lead you to sin, end that relationship. End that trip. Whether it's a certain party, or it's a certain invitation to a certain house or a certain place. In so many words, if you know this is a place that you make sins, you don't go anymore. You don't try it out a second time. Or a third or a fiftieth time. If you fail before, you'll fall again. Third, you have to do the tikkun which requires prayer with sorrow to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, saying I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You don't say, I'm sorry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You haven't done the tikkun. Now to say, I'm sorry in the beginning, usually is tough. Why? Because you're not sorry. It was fun. I liked her. I like him. I like going there. I like feeling that way. I like feeling that way. I want to do it again. In the beginning, you don't feel sorry. That's why it's the third step. Says Rabbi Yisraeli Salam, the reason why a person doesn't say, I'm sorry, is the first step. Is because he doesn't feel I'm sorry. So why is he doing tshuva in the first place? Because he's trying something else. He lived in this neighborhood. He's trying something else. It's not because he doesn't like his current house. He just goes somewhere else. Maybe it's going to be better over there. He goes over there. He misses his old house. Maybe he's going to move back. 
When does he decide that this is the new house is the best? Once he recognizes that he has something better here and what he had wasn't sufficient. When it comes to tshuva, when do you be, feel sorry? Once you distance yourself away from the sin for long enough time to start realizing that you were living in pure filth. You just didn't realize it. It's like someone that works in a public bathroom. Doesn't realize that the stench is over there because he's there all day. When does he realize it? When he first walks in in the morning. Everyone else that's a customer realizes it right away. Why? They're not used to this. But he has got, he's there for five hours. He doesn't, nothing's wrong. He got used to it. A person that's used to sins doesn't realize that he's in spiritual stench. Doesn't realize he's in spiritual filth. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Once you've distanced yourself away from those forbidden relationships, forbidden actions, forbidden words, forbidden music, for long enough time, you'll start realizing, I can't believe I used to say that stuff. I can't believe those people, how they're behaving. Someone to me recently said, Rabbi, these people are animals. I said, who? Ah, oh, these people. I'm like, who? I'm looking for new people. No, these people. Your family? Why? It's your brother, it's your cousin, it's your aunt, it's your uncle. They're nice people. Why are you acting that way? Why? Well, look at them, how they behave and how they act and how they eat and how they dress and how they this. I said, listen, relax, Mr. Holy. You are just like them a year ago, Habibi. Relax, Tadiq, relax. Don't start thinking everybody else is an animal. You're right. But you're not that much different. <laughs> you're right, the little puppies. But you're not, you're a little grown. Relax. Relax, Habibi. The animals. Everybody's an animal. Okay, Habibi, relax. The truth is, he's right. But you should help them, not mock them. Help the people, don't mock the people. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi used to go to the people that had a special disease that was so powerful that if there was an egg on the same street, no one would eat it. Why? The egg would have the disease. The egg would have the disease. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi would hug them and learn Torah with them. Why? He had such kedusha, nothing can touch him. A person that does tshuva for Brit Kodesh can become like that permanently. But the first thing that they have to do is stop, stay away from it, feel sorry about it, which means you have to be away from it for long enough time to realize there's something wrong with it. And guess what? In each level, you realize there's more things wrong with it. In the beginning, you're going to say, okay, it's bad to be with uh, intermarried. A little while later, oh, it's bad to be uh, adulterer. A little while later, Ah, it's bad to be uh, promiscuous. It's bad to this. And then eventually you get to a point where you realize even bad words coming out of your mouth is bad. Bad music is bad. And even using the wrong vocabulary that's not curse words is also bad. Meaning the more you sanctify yourself, the more you realize where you used to be. But the key is Rabotai is to get to that third stage and saying I'm sorry. Fourth, pass the test. What's the test? Same woman, same place. It will come. Why? That's when Akadosh Bahu wants to see if you really did tshuva or not. He'll send you the same test you fail. And you have to pass this time. She was beautiful last time, she'll be beautiful this time too. And he's going to send it. And don't think that just because you've been learning Torah and you've been doing Kiruv and you're doing great things, the test's not going to come. It's going to come. Be ready. You pass it, you enter. You don't pass, you'll get the test again. But you have to be tested. Now all of this is fantastic, but the, the word Tikkun has appeared constantly. 
What I mentioned to you is simply the four steps of tshuva. The tikkun itself is also helping other people fix this. Either by sharing this information, by contributing, by doing a, uh, all types of tikkunim as far as money or as fast. There's different types of things. We have a whole website about it. The point being is, Rabotei Karim, is to know that this is a process. It's a lifelong process. Whatever you can do today, you do today. Whatever you can't do today, you don't do today. But everyone can do something today. Everyone can stop something today. Everyone can learn something today. Everyone can share something today. Everyone can give something today. Whether it be time, it be money, it be an effort, it be an idea, it be something. Everyone can do something. And whatever you can do, that's what you're judged on. You're not judged on what you can do. A Kadosh Baruch Hu is not going to judge you for not giving a million dollars if you don't have a million dollars. If you have five dollars to your name, he's not going to judge you for not giving a million dollars. Why? He's the one that gave you the five dollars in the first place. But if you have a million dollars and you only gave five dollars, guess what? That five dollars is not a source of blessing. It's a source of punishment. Why? Why are you giving five dollars? I gave you a million. Why are you giving five dollars? Oh, so you don't believe in a tikkun. You don't believe you need to rectify yourself. You believe you're firm for it. Enjoy. The key is to know that this is the biggest chesed that a person could do for themselves simply because every one of us needs to do something. And anyone that wants to be a part of the, the, the salvation, bringing Mashiach, building the Beit HaMikdash, Having a Kadosh Bahu's name upon them, the Shekhinah, living literally, where the Shekhinah is constantly around you. So much so that the Arizal says that a Kadosh Bahu opens up his mind and he's able to have different ideas, different uh, uh, abilities that are supernatural in so many words, that are, that are to him. These things are things that. You can't get anywhere else. You can't get any other way. Why? Because so long as there is a deformity in a neshama, whatever blessing that a Kadosh Baruch wants to give a person cannot come. Because there is that gap in the road that we keep mentioning. So, Be'ezat Hashem, this is going to inspire you no less than the punishments have. I personally think missing out and all of this is worse than Gehenom. Gehenom is horrible. Gehenom is terrible. But if a person says, no, I'm doing mitzvot, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to be okay. Fine. But do you realize that you could have gotten all of what I just said and more for one mitzvah? One mitzvah. Simply having, attaining Brit Kodesh. Obviously, it's an effort. It's an attitude, it's a mindset, but nonetheless, it's a single mitzvah that enables a person to fulfill the entire Torah. And for that, you get all of these benefits both in this world and eternity. You get elevated to a level higher than above anyone else. There are special chambers in heaven for those people so much so that he gets the master key. There's different ways to go to Gan Eden for different mitzvot, for different things. A person that has Brit Kodesh can go any way that he wants. So when a person understands this, accepts it, it's easier to live it. A person doesn't believe it, it's very easy to go against the entire Torah. Why? Because once you start picking and choosing what you believe, what you don't believe, it becomes very difficult to choose the right parts to believe because usually a person becomes biased so I'm hoping that every single person that came here and that's watching this you today, tomorrow, a year from now, whenever it is takes this issue seriously why? because if you can achieve this if you can be Shomer Brit you could keep the entire Torah if you can't be Shomer Brit you've already failed the ultimate test Everything also becomes worthless. There's nobody in Gan Eden that has this sin on him until they pay for it. And the, and the payment for it is very, very deep. So the punishment, we know. Now we know the reward, at least a significant segment of it. 
Be'ezat Hashem, all of us have the courage, the wherewithal, and the siyat Dishmaya to achieve this and bring a Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Nachat, and bring salvation to Am Yisrael. With that being said, you guys can ask questions. I'm here, Be'ezat Hashem, looking forward to it. Who wants to ask questions? Usually when I shut off the camera, there's used 500 questions, but let's see if before I shut off the cameras. Yeah, B'chavod, yeah. good question. Two questions. One is how many tikkunim? Two is how long, how do I know it's working? Okay, first question, how many tikkunim depends on the sinner. Depends on the sinner. If you go to the website called tikkunabrit.live over there there's a uh, explanation of tikkunim and over there there's also a list of different sins how many fasts a person needs to make for each sin. Each sin requires that. For example, if somebody wasted seed one time, he has to fast 84 times. Meaning the average teenager simply is never allowed to eat for the next thousand years. <laughs> Somebody that's LGBT, you know, if he sees how much punishment he's going to get in fasts, forget about gay, no more that stuff, just in fast, how many times he has to fast for one single act, he may become suicidal. Meaning that the amount of fast that you have to do for each tikkun, for each single sin, is too much for people to handle. Therefore the Chachamim instituted a way to replace the fast which is with money, which is replacement of the fast with the equivalent of how much it costs to eat per day. So in the Western society like America, I don't know, maybe it costs $5 a day, $10 a day to eat. But if you're a high class, high society type of person, where every day you're spending three, $400 on lunch, then guess what? That's the cost of your tikkun. You can't spend $5 like the guy that can barely, uh, you know, that makes minimum wage, you know, if you're spending three, four hundred dollars a day, that's your tikkun. Either way, a person that does the uh, uh, um, the uh, numbers, the calculation, let's say it's costing five dollars a day uh, to eat, and they have to fast eighty-four times for a single tikkun, right? So you have four hundred twenty dollars. But he didn't sin once; he sinned many times. So how many times should he, how many tikkunim, how many times he sinned? Now he doesn't know how many times. He should estimate, mm -hmm. let's say if he's a teenager, he, uh, he, uh, he, now he's 30 years old, he figured he sinned 10 times a month, times 20 years, he does the math, that's a few hundred, in so many words he has to be a multimillionaire. Now you don't have a multimillionaire bank account. So what do you do? You do whatever you can. You can afford one tikkun per month, you do one tikkun per month. You could afford 10 tikkuns per month, you, you have it like that. You do 10 tikkunim per month. You have five million dollars in the bank, guess what? Make sure you do the tikkun as soon as possible. Don't waste, don't keep that money for, uh, for a rainy day. Use money for, for this. This is why Kedosh will gain money. So it all depends on what you have. But you don't get judged on what you don't have. You get judged on what you do have. Whatever you have, you do something with it. Some people could afford to do one tikkun per month. Some people could afford to do 10. Some people could afford to do a whole lot in one shot. They have it, they have millions. But I can tell you for sure, usually, the people that have a lot do not do big tikkunim. Why? Because usually they have a very, very big desire for money. It's very hard for them to let it go. Very hard for them to write a check for half a million dollars or more for such a thing. They have no problem writing a half a million dollar check for a building or for a watch or for a vacation or, or, or for whatever else. Even to, for a mitzvah. But this specific thing is very, very difficult. Why? Because the amount that you achieve with this is, surpasses everything else. So as far as how many, how much, again, it depends on the crime. Depends the number of crimes. But either way, for the most part, every person that wasn't holy from birth usually has to do something pretty much for the rest of his life to a certain extent. To a certain extent, he should do something for the rest of his life. Whether it's for, for, uh, for this or for that, he should do something. Now, how do I know it's working? I know the tikkun is accepted. I know Hashem is, is, 
couple of ways. Number one, you start seeing blessings in your life. Things change. Things change. You start seeing a Kadosh Baruch Hu is giving you more money. You donated, and a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave you more money. Why? Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu is accepting the tikkun. It's not mean, it doesn't mean you finished, but it means he's accepting the tikkun. He's helping you do it. That's one way. How do I know that a Kadosh Baruch Hu, that my tshuva is complete? To a certain extent, there is no more desire for that particular sin. What's the problem with that? It doesn't happen. It's not with this. The complete tikkun for idolatry, you can do. Why? One day you believe in some guy with long hair and uh, that got uh, crucified. Another day you don't. So you can achieve that and never think about that. And that you can get to. But to achieve not being uh, 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 connected or attracted by immorality is impossible so long as you're alive. Even Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Mir Balanes, Malukva, and many other tzaddikim almost fell. Almost fell. And some of them actually fell. Not the ones that I mentioned, others. So the point is that this, when it comes to immorality, you should already take into account that the tikkun is going to be accepted. You'll get certain blessings in your life, but you'll have to do something and stay um, under the fire, if you will, to constantly do tshuva for the, your whole life. Why? Because if you're not doing tshuva, that means usually you're reversing. If you don't think you need to fix this, that means you don't think there's anything wrong with it anymore. If you don't think you need to fix your eyes, that's probably because you're looking at everything and you don't think there's anything wrong with looking at everything. If you don't think that you need to fix the way that you behave, that's probably because you behave an a- like an animal and you think it's okay to be an animal. So, anytime a person is aware of the, um, the need to be holy, they know that they have to constantly fix themselves. This is the reason why you know, Tzadikim constantly cry over their deeds on Yom Kippur and on a regular basis, even though they're Tzadikim. Because they know that they could always be better. They know that they, uh, they have fell in certain ways, even if it's not in the same ways that the average secular person fell. They fall in their ways. So the tikkun is a lifelong tikkun. But either way, a person uh, could certainly see blessings well before he completes the tikkun, and usually they do. Usually the blessings for such a thing happen relatively quickly. Sometimes it's something that happens in a matter of months. Someone recently, uh, you know, just today, literally told me, I'm not going to necessarily mention names unless they want to do it themselves. Someone did a certain type of tikkun. They had a whole lot of problems in their life. A whole lot of problems in their life. In so many words, they did a certain type of tikkun. They told me today, my whole life is fixed now. I, I wish everybody could tell me that. Hey, Rabbi, my whole life is fixed. That's like somebody says, Rabbi, I'm calling you from heaven. It's really nice over here. You were right. It's like saying that. My whole life is fixed. The greatest thing in the world. Everything worked out. It's the greatest. It's like someone calling you from Olam Abba. Yeah, the trees, they don't look like in the world. They're much nicer here. It's the greatest thing in the world. But that's the thing. That's what you get. That's what a person gets. For those who promised us blessings. If we do what he says, we get them. Next question. Yes. October 7th is not even a playground game next to Gogo Magog. October 7th is not even an indication of Gogo Magog. October 7th is a bunch of gangsters that took advantage of a flawed system that unfortunately uh, was only allowed to work in such a way because of our sins. Uh, Gogu Magog will make October 7th look like a, uh, it didn't exist. Uh, you know, we're talking about two-thirds of the world disintegrating in a relatively short period of time. Uh, not a couple of thousand people. Uh, we're talking about seven years of burying bodies of after the destruction happened. Seven years just to bury the bodies. In so many words, as horrible as October 7th was, it's nothing in comparison to Gogo Magog, and in fact, it's nothing in comparison to all of the other tragedies that Am Yisrael has gone through over its history. If you simply look at any of the pogroms, inquisitions, 
and other holocausts that have happened, even not the one that's most famous from 70 years ago, but other ones. Uh, you see that uh, this is relatively standard. What the Arabs have been doing to us, uh, you know, over the last, uh, you know, 1400 years uh, has been October 7th on a regular basis. It's just that now it's documented. Now they're stupid enough to film themselves. Now the world is uh, oblivious to it even after they see it and they, you know, so now it's a different world because of the perception. But this is not new. You could look at 1927, what they did to us. You could look at uh, 1914. You could look at countless other pogroms they did in the Middle East, in, uh, in um, Tunis, Tripoli. Uh, literally, they would, you know, Poland, uh, in different parts of Russia, the, uh, and some of the people that would do this to us were Jews, like the Efsektia, Imach Shima Vizicham. You know, point is that, that what happened on October 7th is only unique to you. Not you personally, but to our generation. Why? This is kind of like their first experience with something like this. But anyone that's learned in history sees this is nothing new here. It's almost like, you know, when you see like a tragedy happen or some car accident and everybody piles up, wants to see, wants to see, wants to see, and the police say, nothing to see here. Move along, move along. That's the history books. History books tell us this, nothing to see here. Move along. Why? This has been happening to us for 2,000 years. And unfortunately, unless we do tshuva specifically for the Brit Kodesh, it's only going to get much, much worse. Not a curse, it's simply a reality. So I think the, uh, the issues that we have right now are bringing us closer to the salvation, but the salvation doesn't come for free and it doesn't come uh, without, uh, unfortunately, much, much worse things. The uh, Chafetz Chaim uh, said that uh, the First World War was very big and the biggest war that was documented at the time. He says that the next war that's coming, which happened, I believe, something like nine years after he died, the Second World War will make the First World War look like child's play. And the third one that follows this one will make the first and the second one like child's play. After the First World War, the world was shocked, but the Jewish world, to a certain extent, thought they benefited from it to a certain extent. Why? The Jews became more favorable in the eyes of Germany, and everyone thought that salvation is coming. Little did they know that the same place they thought salvation is coming from will actually be the number one enemy. The biggest, some of the biggest supporters of, of Germany during the First World War, just so you know, according to the history books, some of the biggest supporters of Germany were Jews. Zionism were supporters of Germany. Not because they hated Jews, but because they were looking to have aligned interests. They were looking to have aligned interests, and until then they did, to a certain extent. When did that change? When the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin was fulfilled. What does the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin say? If Am Yisrael does not do tshuva, Kadosh Baruch Hu will send them a leader like Haman. They will force him to do tshuva. And that's what happened. After World War I, we were supposed to do tshuva. We didn't do tshuva. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent Haman, also known as Hitler. Also known as Hitler. So the same place that we thought the salvation would come from, i.e. Germany, became number one enemy of the Jews once Haman went in, and he turned the entire country of nearly 80 million people into anti-Semites. 1914, they like Jews. 1917, they like Jews. Shortly thereafter, anti-Semitism begins, grows, 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 culminates in the 1930s to the point where pogroms become standard. Until then, anti-Semitism was standard in Poland and in Russia. That's why the Jews wanted Germany to win. Because there was a lot of anti-Semitism and pogroms were pretty much standard in Poland. So they figured, why should we cheer for, the, for them? They're killing us, even though there's Jews that are living there. And there was constantly conflict between different 
segments of the leaders of Zionism that were stationed in Russia, in Poland, and in Germany, and also in England. Why? Because each one is cheering for the country they're living in because they're looking to get political support. But the same token, you cheer for this guy, you're an enemy of that one. In so many words, Jews should stay out of politics. Go to the Bet Midrash. We're not doing any good by being in politics. We're always going to end up being somebody's enemy. And the one that ended up winning, where everyone cheered, ended up becoming the number one enemy. Why? Politics will never bring salvation. Politics will never bring salvation. Needless to say to Am Yisrael. What brings salvation? Doing tshuva. We didn't do tshuva. Gemara Maseret Sanhedrin. Perek Chelek says, HaKadosh Baruch sends Haman. That's what happened. Now, after World War II, an estimated 6 million Jews and 50 million people were murdered. We were supposed to do tshuva. Some did, some didn't. In so many words, it didn't work out so well. So the Chafetz Chaim says that the next one that will come after the second one will be much worse than the first and the second. So, if you want to know more details of what happened in World War II, during the Holocaust and so on, I have several lectures about it. Highly recommend people to learn what actually transpired, who, what, when, what happened before, what happened during. This is important information so people could know that there's no reason for you to watch the news. Because everything that happened is what will be. What you can do is change the news. How? Change the act. What we did then, don't do now. What didn't work back then, why bother try now? What helped Am Yisrael win all of its wars throughout history? At the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, how did we win the war? Was it politics? No. How did Moshe Rabbeinu win the war against Amalek? Was it because of weapons? No. Was it because of uh, negotiation power? No. Was it because of money? No. Or was it because of Torah? Because of mitzvot. How did David Melech win the wars? Was he a political uh, advocate for certain things? No. Did he have uh, all types of uh, big donors to his campaign for 2024 presidential election? No. How did David Melech become David Melech? Mashiach Tzidkenu. How? Torah. How did he win the wars? Torah. How did Am Yisrael win all of its wars? How does Am Yisrael even exist today, miraculously, despite all of its enemies for several thousand years? Torah. That's it. So if anyone wants to fix the past, the present and the future simultaneously, there's only one cure. And that's tshuva. And it's tshuva starts and ends with Brit Kodesh. Of course, there's other things that everyone has to do in their own level and their own uh, things that they need to do, but needless to say, morality is the ultimate uh, tikkun. And there's other shem, more people do it, so whatever, whatever horrible things that have to come to this world, there has to be a war, there is no way out of the war. All, other people that tell you, oh no, maybe the Second World War was Gogu Magog, it's not possible. Why? There has to be a war before Mashiach comes. Because it's one of the ways, there's 10 different reasons. One of the reasons is that there is a way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to sanctify his name. Where everyone, including the enemy, will know that he is the one and only God. Second reason is an example is that all of the evil neshamot that ever lived, Nebuchadnezzar, Hitler, uh, Yeshu Yimach Shimo, uh, you know, uh, Sancheriv, all of the enemies, the big enemies, they get reincarnated in the last uh, generation, and they get punished in the last generation. And that has to be in a war. And there's several other reasons. Perhaps we'll do a lecture about that one day too. But the point is, is that there has to be a war, it has to be a big one, but you don't have to suffer from it. If you do tshuva for Brit Kodesh, as we heard today, the Shekhinah is among you, the protection is among you, nothing in the world can hurt you. So there is an actual, legitimate way to be protected from all of it. And it's not politics, and it's not any of the other nonsense they tell you. It's simply doing tshuva. Yes, next question. Yes. So basically, I, I'm growing up in a Bukhari family, right, as you know. And so a lot of the people from like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, they're not, they didn't become so religious. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you ask them, you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. 
But it's a lot like what you said in your shiur about like um, that one shiur that you gave, Hashem gave, gave his million. That uh -huh. thing, where you said that you used to believe in your own version of Hashem. Kid. So we kind of like were like... Growing Average up person is like that, yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, environment. So, I know, I, want, I really want to believe in Hashem. I really want to have the bitachon. I just don't... I don't really have it, you know, because I was just like raised in this environment. Obviously, we keep Shabbat, we keep kosher. If you tell like a, if you tell like one of our families, eat pork, they'll be like, you crazy. Right. There's certain things that are customary, and if, 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 if Shabbat was a custom, everybody would keep it. But uh, there's certain things that are customary. That certain certain traditions, certain uh, uh, parts of Am Yisrael, that to them it's uh, this is their uh, foundation. And there's certain things that are not. But the key is to know that there's only one way to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to the point where you become someone that has emunah in him, someone that has, and that's through Torah. Now, Torah means not only learning Torah, but also fulfilling what it says. Those are the two things. You learn Torah and you fulfill what it says, you're going to get to a point where you're gonna, your emunah will continue growing, your uh, understanding will continue growing, your connection to Hashem is going to continue growing. You're not, you can get to a point where you could feel Hashem in your life and see him and communicate to you in different ways. But this takes time. But it's through learning and fulfilling what the Torah says. I'll be very honest with you. I don't really have so much of a learning experience. Like I went to YES, elementary school, probably not to school. I went there for three years. And that's only years that I went to. And I went to public school right after that. I have no, like, my Jewish education is like very limited. I have zero education. So I never you can change that though. Life. I only learned like... That's the way you come to the shield. I, I only learned Mishnah in, in YS about like the Bet HaMikdash, the Mizbeah, about like the 20 Amot or like something like that. That's the only thing I know. That's like what I remember. But that's what you could change. That's what... Listen, if, if you would have told me 15 years ago that I'm going to become a rabbi that is going to influence tens of thousands of people on a regular basis and is going to be, I don't know, 100, 200,000 followers, whatever it is, uh, whatever the numbers are, five followers, whatever the numbers, but they're very, very big. If you told me five followers, five people would listen to me. About Torah, 15 years ago, I'd tell you, come on, what'd you smoke? You stop doing drugs. It's not good for you. It's not good for you. Even back then, I would have told you it's not good for you. Five people could listen to me to learn Torah. I don't know anything. So what happened 15 years? A lot happened. I decided that I can learn. I decided I should learn. I decided I can do. I decided I should do. And guess what? The Satan said, no, you can't. No, you shouldn't. I didn't listen to him. And every day he came back and he told me, no, you couldn't. And no, you shouldn't. And then I tried to beat him every day. And sometimes I won and sometimes I lost. But I keep trying. And every day I try. And every day I try. And every day I try. And sometimes I win. And uh, sometimes I win more. And sometimes I don't. But the key is to keep going. The key is to keep going. Don't give up on yourself before the race started. Because the truth is, the only time that your logic will tell you, maybe you should give up from the beginning, is when it comes to Torah and mitzvot. Everything else, no one wants to give up. If I told you, listen, I have a plan to make a billion dollars in 12 months. What do you think? I'm in. I don't even need to know what it is. Okay, we start doing one, two, three. We make a few phone calls. We make this. The next day I tell you, listen, you know that billion dollar plan in one year? It's not one year. It's five years. What do you think? I don't care. Five years, good too. We'll continue. We come back to work the next day. We make phone calls. A week later, I come back to you. I said, listen, you know that five years? I said the billion dollars. It's not five years. Maybe 15, 20 years. What do you think? Who cares? We're making it. I can tell you a thousand years. You're still going to come to work. Why? Number one, it's still good even if it takes a long time. Number two, everybody always thinks that maybe I could do better. Maybe I could do better. Maybe even if he says it's 15 years, maybe I could do it in five. Maybe I could do it in two. But that's when it comes to materialism. When it comes to Akados Baruch Hu, all of a sudden everybody's, oh, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I should. I don't know if, if I'm made for this. I had somebody tell me, listen, Rabbi, I think that Hashem is simply... When it comes to me, I don't think he's going to obligate me to keep Shabbat. I think he understands that it's just not for me. It's just not for me. I said, you are. he may agree with you. It's just not for you. It's just that the system that he built has uh, something that comes with that decision. That it's not for you. It's just, you're not going to like that system. It's hot and painful and all types of other things. So... The key is to know that the Yetzirah is going to tell you every day you can't. Every day you shouldn't. 
Every day he's going to send you different messages. Sometimes it's in your head. Sometimes if somebody calls you, says, what are you doing? You're learning? No, come on, let's go to the movies. Yeah. Another time somebody shows up, all of a sudden you want to go to shul, all of a sudden, long lost buddy, you haven't seen him in 20 years, shows up in front of your house. Hey, what's up, man? What's going on? You want to come? We'll go into a party. How do you even know where I live? I don't know. Somebody told me, I found out. Uh, who sent him? Satan sent him. The Satan sent him. Satan's going to send him an altar every day. So what are you going to do? You have to win every day. Now, you're not going to win every day. But remember, if you would try to keep going no matter what to chase a billion dollars, if you would try no matter what to achieve your dreams, then you should also try every day, no matter what, to achieve your purpose, which is to do tshuva. And based on the Shem, we succeed. Next question. Yes. Since we are all from the same soul, Adam and Rishon, she are part of the same soul, so I see Adam and Rishon, in essence, had all of the souls. There's certain, but again, the souls are not like humans. Meaning, a human is uh, one entity. And I, if I tell you, listen, I was here and I was there in two places, that's already not a human. So a neshama can be split into an infinite amount of uh, uh, parts, so much so that the Arizal says in Shah Gilgulim that Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't always Moshe Rabbeinu. First, it started with Hevel. Okay, Hevel, there was Kain and Hevel. Kain killed Hevel. Then he reincarnated into Shet. Into Shet. Then he reincarnated into uh, Noach and Shem. What do you mean? Noach and his son Shem? Yes. Wait, the same neshama is alive in two people at the same time? Yes. And guess what? The next generation of Moshe Rabbeinu, he was in multiple places. He wasn't just one. Same thing with Kain. Kain's neshama, for example, is Tikkun. He had to eventually come back. In the, in the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu, he was, part of it was in Itro, part of it was, was in Korach, and part of it was in Egyptian. All three of them lived at the same exact time. Why? Because the neshama is not like a human body. It's not limited... It's, uh, there's different parts of it, there's different tikkunim. Uh, this is also the reason why even if somebody never made a sin when it comes to immorality, never wasted seed, never committed adultery, never cheated on the husband, never cheated on the wife, never cheated on themselves, they should still do a tikkun. Why? If you're in this world, there's a reason for it. You're not here because you're so beautiful. You're not here because you're so, the world needs more good looking people. You're here because you have to do some type of tikkun. And usually that tikkun is from the previous generation, previous carnation, previous time that you lived. So even if you never had this issue, you still need to do a tikkun, because again, this is a uh, you. This is not the first time any of us are here. So when it comes to when it comes to Mashiach, Mashiach has the uh, spark of Moshe Rabbeinu and spark of David the Melech in him, meaning it's multiple aspects of different big neshamot. It's not just like a regular person. That one day Hashem says, decides, okay, you're Superman. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's more to it. But there is a part of the Neshama was part of the original creation, like you mentioned. Uh, and that's also part of, and also part of uh, Adam Elishon. But it's much more than the human brain can, uh, human brain, at least my brain, can comprehend. Next question. Yeah. Very good question. As far as the issue of dying on Kiddush Hashem, this is a very, very important question. Why? Because there is a lot of people throwing around the word dying on Kiddush Hashem like it's free. Anyone that uh, dies because of some type of terrorist attack or because of any reason, people say, oh, he died on Kiddush Hashem. This is not true. Okay, there are different levels of sanctity as far as death. HaKadosh Baruch gives each person what they need, what they deserve. But it's important to know that just because somebody killed a soldier at war or somebody as, as, a, as, as an act of terrorism, it is not Kiddush Hashem. If somebody is an atheist, anti-Torah person and some terrorist kills him, that's not Kiddush Hashem. God's name did not get sanctified as a result of an idol worshiper or atheist person's death. Kiddush Hashem means that the death itself caused Hashem's name to be sanctified, to be glorified. So obviously, if a bunch of people are dancing in front of an idol on October 7th, and a bunch of terrorists go and kill them, God's name is not being sanctified here. If anything, it's being desecrated. 
Number one, that you're dancing and violating the Had. Number two, that there's an idol over there. Number three, that there's Jews are being killed. This is not a sanctification of a Kadosh Bahu's name. To sanctify a Kadosh Bahu's name means that you have to die and your death needs to elevate God's name. How could that be? Like the death of those that defended the Torah, like Rabbi Akiva and his friends. They died defending the Torah. That's dying on Kiddush Hashem. Now, does that mean that dying from a terrorist is worthless? No. There's also dying as a, if somebody is a soldier, and they are not necessarily the most righteous person, but they're dying defending Am Yisrael. That's called Aruge Malchut. Aruge Malchut is not Kiddush Hashem, but it is certainly a high level of kapara for their sins. Uh, how much it erases is a different story, but it's not Kiddush Hashem, it's just, it's a different level. It's called Aruge Malchut. Now, another person that dies not as a soldier, but rather as a, simply as a victim. He's a victim in the Holocaust. He's a victim in a terrorist attack. But he's an atheist. He's a Michal Shabbat. And some terrorist kills him. There's no Kiddush Hashem there. And there's also no Aruge Malchut. What is it? It's a kapara. It's a big kapara. The stranger and more painful the death is, the bigger the kapara. But it's not Kiddush Hashem. They don't just go to Gan Eden uh, automatically and fix everything just because of that kapara. It could very well erase a lot of their sins, but to expect to see Rabbi Akiva and his friends in Gan Eden should not be an expectation. Because it's not Kiddush Hashem. So, now there are people that will distort the truth because they uh, want people to think favorable. They want to be positive. There's even some guy that made a uh, comment on the internet uh, about one of my videos yesterday. Yesterday, the day before yesterday. Uh, and he brought all types of uh, supposable sources for his claim that anyone that dies because they're a Jew is, uh, is dying on Kiddush Hashem. What's the problem? Number one, he wrote what he said. It's not written. It's not written. He just wrote it. Number two, he just translated things the way he wanted to translate. And number three, even a translation that he says doesn't say what he, what he wants you to say. But the message at the end is like, oh, you see that this ignorant, arrogant person, he doesn't say my name, but he's commenting on my video, is wrong. There are rules to Kiddush Hashem. I didn't make them. If it was up, everybody died in Kiddush Hashem. Everybody live in Kiddush Hashem. Everybody goes to Gan Eden, but it's not up to me. I didn't make the Torah. HaKadosh Baruch made the Torah. He has rules to be judged in the same level as Rabbi Akiva that got his body was peeled peeled while he was alive and then eventually his body parts were being sold in the market like meat to eat shish kebab and he said Shema Yisrael during this whole thing he said Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad to expect to be in the same Gan Eden with him how could somebody even have the nerve to say that? Somebody that danced next to an idol, someone that's a Mechalel Shabbat, someone that's not modest, someone that doesn't protect the breed is going to be in the same place as Rabbi Akiva? That's a desecration of a Torah to say such a thing. That's a distortion of logic. So it's important to know, yes, dying is always a kapara. Horrible death, bigger kapara. Horrible tragic death, bigger, bigger kapara. Suffering before death, cancer, rape, whatever other tragedy uh, you know, exists in this world. There are 903 ways to die. He experienced almost all 900. Always a kapara. But to say Rabbi Akiva, it's simply not. It's not Rabbi Akiva. I don't care how many ways you want to reward things. It just doesn't exist. Why? Because there are rules. There are rules of what is and what isn't. Now... If a person is in the middle of tshuva and HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes his neshama, takes our neshama during a part of the tshuva, of course, that that will count for them as something significant because they were in tshuva, which automatically means that they have a share of the world to come. But it doesn't mean that they don't have to pay for whatever sins they haven't fixed yet. Meaning, if you're in a part of tshuva, but you didn't finish the tshuva, so, you did, you're starting tshuva, you're doing tshuva, that means you're assured your section of ulama When you will get there, 
is only after you fix what's still broken. That wasn't fixed during your life. It could either be fixed through a reincarnation, it could be fixed through different sufferings in Shamaim, Chibuta Kefa, Kefa Kela, Geinom. It could be a lot of different ways, there's a lot of different strategies and ways for the Makom, for Akadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, but the point is, is that to go and uh, say, listen, this guy just started putting a keep on last week and he started doing uh, Tikkun Abrit and then he got, died because some uh, Arab uh, uh, terrorist killed him. He goes to heaven, right? No, he doesn't go to heaven. He goes to heaven eventually, but he still has to fix 20 years of Chilu Shabbat. He still has to fix 20 years of wasting seed. It's not the same Tikkun as somebody that didn't fix anything, that didn't do tshuva, but he still has to fix it. It's sort of like, you know, you want to work and you want to become CEO of a company, okay? Now, it's nice to want to be CEO of a company. Today, you CEO of a company, you can make $50 million, $100 million, if not more. Problem is, you have a criminal background. Not you, just a hypothetical example. You have a criminal background. You stabbed a few guys in the face. You said, I'm sorry. You served your sentence a couple of years in jail, which is even, you know, strange of the sentences of how they decide how much, who sentence what. You know, a guy that steals a few dollars, 25 years. A guy that kills people, five years, seven years. Strange. But nonetheless, that's what happens in the world without Torah. Anyway, let's say a person did it. He stabbed a few people in the face, but now he wants to be renewed. He's one of those guys who went to jail. Aside from working out and building himself, making buff, he also read a lot of books. And he decided he wants to be CEO. Wants to be CEO. So now it's nice that you want to be CEO. But unless you start your own company, uh, you have to work your way up. So maybe the first job you're going to get is in a bathroom. Perhaps you keep doing a good job, you clean the toilet really nice and it doesn't smell so bad, we'll move you to the kitchen. And perhaps after a little while, if you know, if you show up on time and everybody eats and there's always what you say is going to eat that people eat and they don't get sick, perhaps we'll move you to the mail room. And maybe if you're good enough at giving the mail on time, if that's even still available at the time and everything is not digital, then we'll move you maybe to the sales floor. And if you make enough sales, perhaps we'll make you manager. And if you're a good enough manager, perhaps we'll make you vice president. And if you're vice president of here, vice president of a division. And, then a, and eventually you can get to be CEO. Yeah, but I want to do it now. You can want all you want, Habibi. You have to build yourself up. Why? Because you didn't come from my father is a multi-billionaire and I am a genius background. You came from a criminal background. You started from the bottom. Which, by the way, it's interesting of how getting out of high school, going out of jail, it's the same criminal background almost. Everybody starts from the bottom. Everybody starts from the bottom. But you, everybody can go to the top. Everybody can go to the top. But everybody starts in the same way. Everybody starts the same way. You start in the bottom. Now, how do you start in the top? If you're already there. How are you already there? You're something above and beyond the norm. But that's generally not something standard. That's generally not common. So the same concept... In a spiritual world, a person can't say, listen, but I want to go to heaven. Great, you want to go to heaven. You have to earn it. You have to build it. You have to do certain things. Hashem is not going to give, give you a get out of jail free card just because he needs people to die. The people that get to die on Kiddush Hashem are tzaddikim, meaning they deserve to die on Kiddush Hashem. It's a merit to die in Kiddush Hashem. Someone that dies in a horrible way, certainly HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing him a favor sometimes because better they die than live in the way that they're living, but it's, it's not the same thing. So either way, the ultimate conclusion is, can everyone get to heaven if they do tshuva? Yes, they can. If they don't do tshuva, no, they can't. Now, if a person didn't get a chance to do tshuva and he died a tragic death, that's Hashem's mercy is giving him a different way to get there. A different way to get to Gan Eden, a different way to restart, a different way. But there's no get out of jail free card where a person could be a criminal against Hashem their whole life and end up in the same place as, as uh, Rabbi Akiva and Moshe Rabbeinu. There is no such thing. They will never be because that would turn the entire Torah into a lie. 
And a Kadosh Baruch Hu's signature is emet, and that, that's obviously the foundation, that's truth. So, it's important for people to know everything I just said, even though your question was, didn't necessarily require everything I just said, because there's so much lies out there. There's so much lies out there, and unfortunately, it's giving people the perception that it's easy to get to heaven. All you need to do is die. Before you know it, they're going to start having campaigns. Who wants to kill me? Who wants terrorists wants to kill me? I want to go to heaven already. They don't like their life. They're going to be one of these reporters that goes to Gaza to report. Or they'll go to university with that protest. Almost the same thing. So, Kabutai, there's no free tickets to Gan Eden. There are big tickets that you can acquire by doing tshuva, by learning Torah, by doing kiru, by doing tshuva for Beit Kodesh, things like that. But there's no free lunch. Anyone that wants to go to heaven will have to work for it. Anyone that tells you otherwise is either a liar or is ignorant. Usually it's a combination of both. Next question. Yes. Thank you. So, okay, so as far as thinking that Mount Grizim was where Bet HaMikdash is, it's, it's a mistake. I don't know if it's necessarily, um, you know, this is, a, this is a healthy person to think such a thing uh, because there is not only uh, Torah sources, there's archaeological sources. There's historical sources of exactly what it was. So usually a person that has that belief being wrong, usually there's much more wrong with him or her than just that one thing. You know, it's like people that, for example, that are against the Zohar. So, ah, I don't believe in the Zohar, you know, I read what such and such wrote, there was a Chacham in, 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 in Yemen, and he wrote this, and it's not really Rabbi Shimon, and they make a whole big deal about how they don't think the Zohar is, is authentic. And what I've found out over the years is that that's usually the least of their problems. Even though Chachamim, like Avadia and Astaip Legaon, and, and all of Gdolei Israel have vouched for the Zohar, it's holy, it's Kodesh Kodeshim, and so on, even if you want to negate that and just imagine none of that happened, the people that usually fight against it are usually people that have a lot more problems than just the Zohar. Usually they have a lot of other issues that are much worse where they're either they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead or they don't believe that uh, Mashiach will come or they don't believe that God actually is watching and sees and knows everything that you're thinking at every single moment which is Azgacha Pratit and a bunch of other foundational beliefs. So usually people that have such a distorted belief in one thing that distorted belief usually has friends that distorted belief usually has friends so I wouldn't necessarily call the person a heretic if he says I think that that the Bet HaMikdash was in New York uh, I would probably call him stupid maybe not to his face because I'll probably feel bad for him uh, but uh, and I'll try to help him but if he insists that it was in maybe in 770 that's where the Bet HaMikdash was or uh, until they broke it a few days ago uh, or uh, or it's somewhere else. You know, if that's his only problem, then Baruch Hashem is his only problem, but it's usually not. It's usually not. Um, now, as far as the second thing uh, in regards to, uh, for a woman, a woman needs to know that everything that uh, I said applies to her, meaning that although she may not have the issues of, a, uh, of, of the man, she also has issues. Why? Because as righteous as a woman is, as, as, as amazing as a woman is, she also has a th thoughts. In fact, I'm going to tell you something that no one's ever going to tell you. Especially you, you, you ladies, no one's ever going to tell you this. The biggest reason why Chachamim say that women should not learn Gemara. Not the forbidden. Not, they shouldn't. If a woman learns Gemara, it's usually a bad sign. Why? It means that she's usually uh, going against the Chachamim. But she's not forbidden. Why? The daughters of Rashi learned Gemara. But it was a different generation, a different time. Why should a woman not learn Gemara? Even at the time of the Gemara, they said she women should not learn Gemara. The ultimate reason, a bigger reason, is because it's not your obligation. You have other obligations. To raise kids, to help your husband, raise the house. If you're learning Gemara, when you're doing your duties. 
But the other reason also is because the Gemara talks about things of immorality on a regular basis. Every Masechet, there are topics that discuss immorality in some way or another. There are topics that talk morality. The issues between him and her. And that affects the woman differently than it affects the man. It affects the woman differently than it affects the man. So much so that it says that it's better for women not, learn, not to learn it at all. Why? Because, again, it'll affect it differently. In an unfavorable way, not a favorable way. Whereas a man is protected. If he learns Torah, even if he learns about immorality, he doesn't get bad thoughts. A woman can. Why? Because it's not an obligation. So, point being is, is that a woman's mind also needs to be cleaned. So even if she looks righteous, even if she is righteous, that doesn't mean that she's righteous forever and clean forever. She has to work on herself. Second thing is, she has to obviously help her husband. She has to help her husband learn Torah. She has to help her husband with the issues of morality. Third, she has to raise kids. Make sure that the kids are moral. That in itself is, a, uh, is, is, a, uh, is an extraordinary undertaking. To have kids that are moral today is an achievement of all achievements. Third is to try to help others. Try to help others. Try to help some of the women in the community that are not modest, that are not moral. I know that some of you are so holy that you're only, you're only friends with, uh, with religious people, but I can tell you that some of the religious people that I have that are students of mine, they tell me what really happens in their religious friendship and religious community, and it's not so religious sometimes, even though they're religious. You know, sometimes they tell me that the religious people do non-religious things, like cheat, like adultery, like prostitution, like gambling, you know, like the stuff like the, the secular people do. Why? Because the Yetzirah is in every community. And if you have the time and the knowledge, use it to help people. Now, you're not a speaker. Who said you need to be? Bring the speaker there to speak to them. Oh, but the speaker is too far. No problem. Bring them to one place and put the speaker on a TV, on a screen of some kind. Make them uh, there or arrange a shield. The point is that do something to help others. Why? Because even if you yourself don't need every part of the list that I mentioned as far as the tikkun, certainly you're in this world because you have to fix something. Sometimes that something is you have to help other people because you caused other people to sin in the past. Sometimes that fixing is you have to fix your eyes and stop looking at things that don't belong to you. She may not tell her husband, but she really likes the way that the gardener or the pool guy looks. And every time he comes, she gets excited. And she never did anything. And she never said anything. But she gets excited when she sees the pool guy come. Guess what? It's not allowed to do that. And if you keep doing that, eventually you're going to sin. Maybe not with the pool guy, but with somebody else. I had a guy. Nice guy. He had everything. Wife, six, seven kids, business, making millions of dollars. One day, he cries to me. What happened? You're never going to believe it. He found that his wife, who's not exactly the, she didn't win any world beauty contest. But his wife doesn't want to be with him anymore. Why? She found somebody better. Who? His accountant. The guy pays $50,000 a year while he makes millions of dollars. She wants to be with him. And since she figured that he's going to agree, she already started the relationship. In so many words, adultery. Now, does that make any sense? Leaving a multimillionaire, you have six kids with the guy for some accountant? No, it doesn't make sense. But the Satan doesn't need to make sense. It doesn't need to make sense. And that's why a person needs to know that if you are alive, there has to be something you have to fix. Sometimes you have to fix your eyes. Sometimes you have to fix your ears. You listen to dirty music. You listen to dirty words. Sometimes you have to fix the way you speak. Sometimes you have to, the fact that you speak so much, you have to fix that. Some people, they have, I don't know if you guys ever heard me say this. I've been saying this for the last few months because this is something new. Something new. 
It's a big, big, horrible thing. Very scary. It's gay and parties. You guys ever hear of gay and parties? You ever heard of gay and parties? It's a party that everybody goes to gay and You know what it is? They have a party. Well, it's not really a party, by the way. It's just a bunch of girls getting together. Or a bunch of guys getting together. And you know what they do? They talk about other people. Oh, you hear what happened to her? Yeah, she's getting divorced. Oh, you hear what happened to them? Yeah, their son is sick. Oh, you hear what happened to them? They just bought a new car. Oh, you hear what happened to them? You hear what he did, what he said, what she said, what that said? Everyone there is going to gain home. Why? It's all Lashonara. It's all Lashonara. So sometimes the biggest tikkun for a woman is the mouth. As the Gemara says, ten levels of speaking were brought to the world, nine were given to women. So a woman that has this trait where she likes to talk, she was created that way, what is she going to do? She has to use this trait for positive reasons. You need to talk. Talk about the Torah. You need to talk, help people do tshuva. You can't just tell a woman, don't talk. It's like me telling you, don't breathe. <laughs> it's not going to happen. She has to talk. She has to talk. Fine, talk. Talk. But talk about, stop Lashon Ara. Stop Lashon Ara. Why? Because if she goes to get on, where do you think the husband's coming? What, do you think the husband's going to be in Gan Eden? Honey, I'll see you later. No, Kapar Alech, are you going together? You guys are together, you're a couple forever. You're a couple forever. You know, love mates, uh, what is it called? Soulmates? Soulmates. Soulmates. BFFs, all that good stuff. Yeah, you go together. You go together. So a person needs to know. If you are in this world, certainly there's something you can do. And some, certainly there's something you can fix. You can fix your eyes, you can fix your mouth, you can fix your ears. You fix uh, simply the, the way that you behave. Some people, they are kosher, but not kosher. Last example, and then I'll go to the next question. They're kosher, but not kosher. What's kosher, but not kosher? In so many words, they want to be like uh, chickens or rabbits. Where constantly be together with their spouse. Now, there are certain circumstances that this is necessary. But if it's to the point where you're together so much that your husband never has the ability to learn Torah because he's always pretty much spent, then it's not good. If you need so much of your husband's time and effort that he can't learn Torah, you have a problem. You have to fix it. You have to slow down. If the husband... Is, 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 is so uh, addicted to it that he doesn't even care whether his wife is, is enjoying or not enjoying, that's a problem. So again, even the things that are allowed are not necessarily allowed as a free-for-all, do whatever, whenever. You have to sanctify yourself, as the Ramban says, sanctify yourself not only through the staying away from the things that are forbidden, sanctify yourself through the things that are allowed. Sanctify yourself through the things that you're allowed to do. You're allowed to eat, but you're not allowed to eat like a pig. By the way, one of the Sfarim of uh, Rabbi Aaron Rata, is also very, very famous, is also in regards to eating. That I don't think we're at the level yet. Let's fix our breed first. But the key is to know that you can sanctify yourself through the things that are, that are, that are allowed. So certainly a woman can do this. So we said... Fixing all of these things, something. Two, is helping the husband. Three, kids. Four, other people. Other people. Between all of that, I'm sure you're going to find a lot to do. And Bezad Hashem, she and he always succeed. Next question. Yes, in the back. No, I just want to understand the all the way from California. Yes, yes, Chef. Uh, I just want to understand what the Lord said regarding the uh, person who and therefore have a child to study. Is it because that from the co-op of Shemir Breach that becomes a, a lazy father who is a in all the ways that they do and therefore it directly influences the child to also become uh, a city like him? Or okay. is it more of a spiritual effect that uh, has on a child and therefore the father can be not necessarily perfect in all ways but if you just did that one, you know, act of, you know, treatment, you can change this 
The answer, the answer to your question is twofold. Answer is very important. Answer, don't leave. Listen to this answer. Why this answer is going to change all of your lives? Can't believe I forgot to even tell you this bit of information. Number one, simple answer to what you said is protecting the breathing, attaining Brit Kodesh so great that a person is going to be great at teaching his kid to be a tzaddik or does he simply get a tzaddik? Answer is, he gets a tzaddik. Meaning, there is a place called Guf in Shamaim. In the place Guf, there are Neshamot. All of the Neshamot need to come to this world before the end, before the salvation. Okay? But there's also a certain part within this Guf where there are new Neshamot or pure Neshamot that need to come to this world. Either new to elevate the generation or very high level Neshamot to also elevate the generation but also do it some type of Tikkun. But they're tzaddikim. They're, they're born tzaddikim. They're born prone to holy things. They have no interest in evil. They don't know what evil is even. I've seen this. It's not common, but I've seen it. And it's very unique. It's very unusual. You think you're in a different world. Uh, and it's amazing. Now, a person that has Brit Kodesh gets one of those neshamot, at least one. They can get more than one. But it's at least one. Why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu testifies that everyone will see the blessing you got. A tzaddik is not something you miss. Someone that's religious you can miss, not miss. He could look like a construction worker, he could look like a banker, he could look like a Wall Streeter. A tzaddik you don't miss. Why? Everyone knows what a tzaddik is. Everyone knows, even the kings of different nations, the were anti-Semitic. Go to the tzaddikim. Even at the time of the different uh, pogroms in Poland and, and Lita in Russia, they would still go to the Maharal in Prague. The same kings that were anti-Semitic would go to the Maharal in Prague and ask him for blessings and ask him for advice. Why? Tzaddik. Everyone knows Tzaddik is different. So a person that's a Shomer Brit is promised to get one of those Neshamot. Two, it's the part that you don't want to miss. Attaining Brit Kodesh is so great and so significant that even if someone only did that, like you mentioned in your question, he wasn't exactly the biggest tzaddik, he wasn't the biggest learner, he wasn't the biggest wise guy, he just succeeded in Brit Kodesh. Does he still get the kid? Not only does he still get the kid, not only does he still get the kid, but a person that attained Brit Kodesh, even if he has other sins, not intentional sins like idol worship, but other sins as the way of the world. Says Rabbi Aaron Rata, since he has the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu on him. Multiple names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu on him. And the Shekhinah has his name there. And he has the Din Malchut. He has like, he's like a king. And the people, the, the angels of, of Genom cannot touch him. And the Mazikim are scared of him. But he has other sins. What do you do? HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes sure to give him whatever tikkun he has to get in different ways. He's not allowed to go to Gainal. Meaning, he'll give him a flat tire. He'll give him a... He'll lose a foot. He'll give him a, I don't know. He'll have a, 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 some type of other tikkun, but it's not going to be Gainal. It's not going to be Chibut HaKevel. It's not going to be the horrible things. It'll be much, much easier. Why? The tikkun abrit is so significant that in essence it overcompensates for other failings to the point where you still have to pay for the other failings but it's in lower form why because once you do the tikkun you've achieved there you've achieved the purpose and everything is is insignificant in front of it this when i read this i wanted to cry why because there's so many things that are, the average person has suffered is, is, is lacking it's um, okay, even if I do this, uh, this tikkun abrit, like Shabbat, uh, I don't know, a bunch of other things, uh, I missed here, I missed there, I screwed up here, I screwed up there, I'm still probably, no, 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 he said no. Suffering will come in a different way, payment will come in a different way, and it's not going to be in those horrible places. It's not going to be in those horrible ways, and this also, by the way, explains why sometimes you'll see tzaddikim have certain sufferings, because HaKadosh Baruch is in essence, Giving them whatever uh, form of suffering instead of it being, I don't know, a thousand years in Genom, he gives them, I don't know, a, pain, a heartache for, uh, for a year. 
which when you really know the full picture, it's a very, very big discount. Why? Because the Brit Kodesh is simply that big. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is the only one. Because this is the, the this is the only mitzvah that has all of these. This is the only mitzvah that's capable of all of these, because this mitzvah is, is the reason why the world was why the world exists. This is why Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world. He created it for the sake of the Brit. This is why Kadosh Baruch Hu allows the world to exist for the sake of people that protect the Brit. And this is why the world will achieve its purpose. And when uh, when Mashiach comes and the culmination of the world for the people that have holy brit, meaning after Mashiach, whoever exists after, are only people that have pure brit. Person that kept mitzvot, kept Shabbat, kept a bunch of other things, but didn't have a holy brit, he's not gonna he's not gonna be around. He has to he has to do the tikkun in a different way, and it's a very very painful way. The world of Mashiach, and needless to say, the higher level, which is the uh, world after Yom Adin Gadol, only exists for people that have Brit Kodesh. Because this is the foundation, and in essence, this is the what Hashem looks at into this world every day and says, the world has a right to exist. But He sees whoever is actually protecting the Brit, and that's how the, uh, the world. Read the uh, section. This, if you, even if you don't read the whole Tarat Kodesh, and you read these uh, this Ma'amar, Ma'amar, it's called Ma'amar, Ma'alot Nutreya Yesod. It's the 80 different Ma'alot that you get for uh, protecting the Brit. He talks about this particular point multiple times. In so many words, if not for the Brit, the world has no right to exist. Hence the reason also why when someone is a Pogem Brit, when one wastes seed or act, acts of immorality or pedophilia or something else, why the punishment are, is so heavy in comparison to, let's say, stealing or murder. The punishment on someone that wastes seed is much worse than a murderer. The punishment for someone that wastes seed is much worse than, uh, I don't know, let's say a, somebody that um, you know, does a lot of other horrible things. Why? Because the wasting seed is, in essence, antithetical not only to him being created, it's antithetical to the entire creation. It's in essence declaring a war against God one-on-one. -on -one. Because this is in essence the purpose of why he created it. So it's a, I know it's at first, it seems like this is too much for what seems like, like, why? But when you read the, the Sfarim, um, you see that this is pretty much standard Judaism. The only reason why... In our current generation, and even the last couple of generations, why this has become uh, less well known is like what Rabbi Aronata was saying earlier, which is that the Yetzirah has convinced people not to talk about it, to be ashamed of talking about it, to the point where we have ignorance uh, becoming a standard, where people don't even realize how important it is. People think that protecting your breed is just having a breed milah. If that was the case, then you have a bunch of Arabs and Christians that are going to heaven also, even though they're idol worshippers or heretics or murderers. The Brit Milah is not, is, not, is, not, is not enough. Morality is the ultimate purpose of why this world exists. So when a, when a person you know, sees these words, it's literally unbelievable. On one end, how ignorant the world is. On another end, how much the reward is for this one thing. In so many words, you can do this, you achieve your, your purpose in life. And remember, I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize or say, oh, okay, so I'll just be celibate. I'll be a eunuch. You know? No, no, that's not, that's not, that's not tikkun abrit. Not being intimate is not enough. You know, some people are not intimate. Say, like, oh, okay, so I've never been intimate, so I'm fine, right? No. Why? Because again, like I said, number one is it involves other body parts also. Your mind, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, and so on. But also, this is not the first time you've ever been here. Not the first time you've ever been here. So, tikkun is available for all, and the, 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 the promise of reward is more significant than anything else. Next question? Anybody? Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, if somebody gets the Gan Eden, that means they have to have some level of merits, some level of good, because you can't enter Gan Eden without some level of merits. If they didn't do anything bad, um, that means that they'll avoid the punishment. But they, in order to get to heaven, they have to have, excuse me, they have to have some form of merits to go to heaven. Now, as far as not having more, uh, yes, they will have a uh, significant form of regret because the, there's no end to the reward. There's no end to the level that a person can get to. You know, where the more they have, the higher the level. And that more gets renewed on a regular basis. Every year, there's more you generate. And your neshama can go higher. I don't want to scare you guys, but also the, the, the neshama gets judged again every so often. The neshama gets judged again, and sometimes the neshama, in order for it to go to a higher level, it has to suffer. So sometimes it'll act, a tzaddik will have to be reincarnated in a fish, or in a, some animal, or even go and, uh, you know, uh, get, in, in so many words, burned. Uh, in order for them to go to a higher level. But they want this. Not because they like pain, but rather because the reward is that great. But why are they getting punished if they already aren't going to Because the higher the level, the, uh, the more things get judged. Meaning things that are allowed for everybody else, on this level, when you go to the higher level, they're no longer allowed. So now you're expected to do a chumrah. So example... One of the things he brings in Shalagi Gulim in chapter 22, he says that the Ariza one time told his students, so you see that sheep? That sheep is one of the uh, righteous people that lived at the time of the Tanaim. And he had to be reincarnated in this sheep because he was intimate with his wife during daylight. Now again, this is not a... Uh, if, if a person is holy, usually they're you know, going to have dark. But the point is that even if a person... Uh, did such a thing, it's not like a death sentence, you're not going to gain home for it on a standard level. But on a higher level, it's different. It's different. And how high is the higher level? There's no end. It keeps getting higher, higher, higher. Uh, but again, let's just get there. <laughs> let's, let's just get there. There's other Sam. We'll figure it out after. Let's, let's just get to Ganet. Then I don't think anyone needs to be worried about. Uh, uh, the highest level of Gan Eden, not because you guys are not righteous or anything like that, just simply because if you focus on simply getting to Gan Eden and not getting to Gehenom, usually you're doing fine. Usually you're doing fine. But don't think, the, 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 the Torah is very deep and, 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 and endless. So as much as I've done and as much as I've said and as much as I've written over the years, it's not even 1% of 1% of 1%. Of those same exact subjects, not even the entire Torah, forget about the entire Torah. Even the subjects that I've spoken about, what I've told you guys today, is only a spectrum of the whole thing. Uh, this, this, it's, the, the, the issues and, uh, you know, are, are endless. But hopefully this is enough to give the, uh, the issue, you know, to put the issue in front of you and make it uh, significant enough for you to act. Yeah, next one, none, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so as far as tornadoes and other natural disasters, there are constantly going to be things that HaKadosh Baruch brings to the world. The bigger the disaster, the bigger the message. Meaning every time something happens, Am Yisrael is specifically supposed to take some Musar from it. If you hear that there was a tsunami in Japan and a bunch of people died, Chafetz Chaim says that's because Am Yisrael needs to know that they need to do tshuva. Yeah, but the Japanese died. Why do I need to do tshuva? It's because... It's a message for you. It's always for Ami said to do tshuva. So the same concept of something that happens. Now, what a difference does it make 
if the tsunami happens in Japan or it happens in, uh, in, uh, in a community that's much closer to you, the closer it is to home, the more it's supposed to affect you, the more you are responsible for it. Meaning, there's a tornado in Fort Lauderdale, part of the reason is you. Yeah, you, which means me, which means you, which means everyone that lives near it. Why? Simple. It happened near you. It happened near you. That means that it's, it's, you're part of the reason. Yeah, but I'm doing good. You could do better. You could do better. So the point is that a person needs to always know that every one of these things are messages from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, of course, sometimes HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give a scare and not necessarily going to kill. Uh, he's not looking to just kill people. But it is certainly a message for people to know that every time there's some type of tragedy, there's some type of you know, major uh, uh, disaster of some kind, even if the disaster is a possible disaster that's avoided, it's still, these are always indications that the area needs to do tshuva. Perhaps the area needs to keep more Shabbat, perhaps the area needs to stop uh, using technology for the wrong reasons, and all and, and countless other reasons of why Kadosh Baruch does what he does. And the people that are closest to it uh, should be the ones that, uh, you know, that do more tshuva and do more because of it. Now in regards to uh, people doing uh, Kiruv and, and using the, uh, uh, our organization as a place where they could you know, get books and, and you know, USBs and all types of things to give them out to people, I tell you this, um, if a person knew what they can get for doing Kiruv, they wouldn't do anything else. In so many words, when Rebbe Kadosh, the one that wrote the Mishnah, when he himself learned the ma'ala, the level that his, uh, his uh, nephew, Rabbi Chia, the way he's treated in Shemaim because he does Kiruv, Rebbe started crying and started looking for people in the street to help him do tshuva. Rebbe, Rebbe, the one that wrote the Mishnah, Rebbe, the one that was supposed to be Mashiach, if Mashiach came in his generation, he was looking to help people do tshuva. What's, when he understood what it is. The Chachamim tell us that if a person knew what Kiruv does, they would simply spend seven years doing it. Meaning their whole life just doing that and not spend their time doing anything else. Now, of course, people need to live, people need to eat, people need to make money. Some people work in Kiruv, some people don't. But the point is that a person... If they really knew how valuable Kiruv is, they would do it on a regular basis. Now, when I first started uh, doing tshuva and so on, I didn't speak. The way I started, I started uh, helping my, my, my Rav, publicizing his lectures on YouTube. Then later on, I started publicizing lectures by Rav Mizrahi and giving out his CDs, answering questions. And in so many words, I started doing Kiruv for other people, for free. And simply just because I knew it was good, I wanted to help other people, I'd spend money on it, I would order CDs, I would buy books. I never got anything for free. I never got anything for free. I spent almost every dollar that I had getting stuff to help uh, other rabbis publicize their Torah. Why? Because I knew that people need to do tshuva. And I knew I need them to do tshuva. And I knew this is a good match. And if that means I'm going to have to spend every penny that I have, then by all means, now, I did as much as I could. And then, of course, the Kadosh Baruch Hu changed, you know, circumstances, money changed, health changed, a lot of other things changed, and ultimately, here I am today, Baruch Hashem. But the point is, is that I can tell you this. When I first started, I would spend money, lots of money, to try to do as much as I possibly can. People today can get a lot of stuff that we have for free. Almost everything we do is free. If they don't do it, if they don't utilize and take advantage of that opportunity, I think that if you have a list of, let's say, a top five things that a person will regret when they go up to Shemaim, that's going to be one of them. They can regret, I don't know, cheating on somebody, lying to somebody, making a certain sin. They can regret certain things, but top five, at least one of them is going to be this. Why? Not only you can do it, not only you know about it, but you can do it for free. And you still don't do it. There's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Now, of course, not everybody has the time. Some people are busy making money. No problem. Some people are busy raising their kids. No problem. But you can still help. How? You contribute. You could donate. You could get other people to donate. Everybody says, yeah, you know, my cousin, he's really rich. My grandfather is really rich. Okay, why do I care? Unless your grandfather or your cousin starts donating. Nobody doesn't know you, but you know him. 
So you call him and tell him. Oh, but I don't know, but I don't know, but I don't know. Okay, so you're missing out a bigger mitzvah. Why? Because you convincing him to donate is more valuable than even if you donate. As Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai teaches, Gadola Greater is the one that enables others to do than the ones that does himself. Point is, everybody, if they take the Torah seriously and their own tshuva, their own mission seriously, they'll find themselves very, very busy. Very, very busy. People sometimes ask me, oh, when do you sleep? I sleep when I'm tired. Baruch Hashem, not often. But the reason why I'm not as tired as other people is because I'm very busy. Collecting mitzvot, helping neshamot. There's always something to do. There's always something to do. There's always somebody that needs help. There's always something more to learn. There's always someone to, to, to help, you know, get some type of an answer, get some type of solution. There's always something to do. The more you know, the more you realize there's literally not enough time in a day to do everything that you can do. And that's why I say that if, when a person gets up to Shemaim, one of their regrets, aside from sins and everything else, is going to be that they didn't do enough to help other people do tshuva. Because today, it's very, very easy to do it, and you can even do it for free. Even if somebody doesn't want to give books, they can still share things on the internet. I mean, it's, it, there's literally endless ways to, to, to do it. Okay. Uh, unless there's any other pertinent question. Oh, in uh, Yeah, go ahead. I know some people want to go, and I, maybe somebody wants a blessing, wants to talk to me, so I figured I'd give you the... Uh, yeah, so I just don't understand how that... Um, I'm referring to it, I think just in general, that um, you know, a great is not mentioned clearly in a passage of the Torah, unlike the Rebbe Shabbat. And Shabbat also mentions multiple times in order to take it out from where it is. We, like, clearly it's very, like, I'm not denying that it's not true that much. Like, obviously it's, it's very far from the door, right? Why would the Shem say at least once to indicate that it should be faster, right? Um, and why do you even go to the door to find out that it's... But it's not the door, it's all over the Gemara. It's all over the Chumash. It's all over everywhere. No, but it's not a clear passage that says that it's completely awesome. Okay, so no, for something to be... Okay, so... All right, so. No, not that it's just Aaron on on. Second parasha. Second parasha. You know, first parasha, we have the Tikkun Abrit happening with Adam Arishon. You just have to go to the Gemara in several places to talk about how Adam Arishon you know, had Nitzotot Kodesh, had uh, Zera come out of him. He wasted seed. And part of your tikkun and being in this world is the tikkun of Adam Arishon. So Adam Arishon already parashat Bereshit. There's already the issues of, of morality. Now, of course, not everything is written literally in the Torah simply because it's not a history book and it's not supposed to be, uh, um, be read literally. There's the, uh, there's the commentary, there's the halacha, there's the hints, there's the drash, there's, there's a lot of different aspects to the Torah. But already in the first, first parasha, the first word, Bereshit, as I mentioned before, already talks about Brit Ish. Bet Resh, Yutaf of Bereshit, that's Brit, and Aleph Shin in the middle is Ish, Brit Ish. So already from there, the uh, Chachamim tell us that the word, uh, Kadosh Baruch created the world for the sake of the Brit. Already from the first word. Now, furthermore, uh, Adam Arishon failed in the Brit. Second, the issues of immorality was also found in the snake, in the serpent. He wanted to marry Chava, and the Gemara Masechet Abu Dazra says he raped her. Third, Parashat Noach, the second parasha. Why was uh, the generation of Noach destroyed? Because of immorality, where the... the, uh, the uh, Nephilim married the women and became immoral, wasting seed, homosexuality, all of that happened. That's the reason why the generation of uh, the flood existed. It's already a second parasha. Okay? Uh, every parasha has, the, has matters when it comes to, uh, to morality. If you fast forward to, uh, to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, why were they destroyed? Because of immorality, because of uh, you know, homosexuality, wasting seed, and so on. Why was Am Yisrael punished so many different times? It was constantly related to immorality, especially the famous ones in Parashat Balak, Parashat Pinchas, uh, you know, it's a, uh, uh, the Cosby and, uh, uh, and um, Cosby Batsul, uh, and uh, also you have in, uh, um, the issue with uh, Yehuda, Yehuda and Tamar, Yosef HaTzadik, 
So the issues of the Brit are literally in every single parasha. It's every single parasha. Now, as far as mentioning a specific pasuk, there are specific psukim, but we don't understand them that way because we're looking at things from a different perspective. For example, lotinaf, lotinaf, in the uh, 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 um, in the Torah, in the Ten Commandments, that's referring to wasting seed. It's not referring to don't be uh, an adulterer. You go to like Gemara, Masechet Nida. It says, "What is this?" It says, "Talk about wasting seed." He's referring not with the hands and not with the legs. So this is not only a pasuk, this is one of the Ten Commandments. Why don't we understand it? Because we're reading Christian translations sometimes, or reading what people say it is. But when you learn the Gemara, and you learn the proper definition of everything, you see that this is not only in the Torah, it's everywhere. If every single word in the Torah was Brit, I wouldn't be surprised because of how much we found this everywhere. This is not like, this is standard teaching. Now, as far as the, uh, the Zohar, the Zohar doesn't necessarily give a, uh, all of the Chidushim about the, uh, uh, about the Brit because a lot of it you're going to find in the Gemara. A lot of it you're going to find in Masechet Nida, you're going to find in Masechet Sanhedrin, you're going to find in Masechet Shabbat, in pretty much in every Masechet that talks about it to some extent, uh, some more, some less. But uh, it's important to know that if we're looking for a Pasuk, the only time that we must have a Pasuk, uh, or actually two Pasukim, two Pasukim uh, is if it's a death penalty in this world. So if you go to the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, you're going to constantly run into uh, debates between the Chachamim where they say, oh, this is forbidden and this is the verse. And if he does this, he gets death penalty. And the Chachamim returns, no. This is, says that it's death penalty. You're right. It says if he does this, death penalty. But we don't accept it unless there's a second pasuk that says this somewhere else warning him. If there's no warning, even if there's a verse that says death penalty, it's not death penalty. Why? Because for that, we need actual literal psukim that say exactly what it is. But for things that are heavenly punishment and not, uh, uh, not the punishment in this world, it works differently. Plus again, the, the limitations as far as vocabulary that we use uh, is not because that's the only words that exist, but rather because that's the words that uh, people are familiar with. Like for example, there is no actual word in the holy language for the male member not and also the female member there's no actual word for it both the male member and the female member are called erva but erva actually means nakedness but that's what you call it why because the holy language is clean so you're never going to find a verse that says don't do that with that part it doesn't exist because the word doesn't exist. But there are things that imply it in other ways. And one of the biggest things that show us this is what happens in the Torah. In Bereshit, in Noah, and practically every other parasha is there, Sodom and Gomorrah, Mitzrayim, and so on and so forth. Uh, but as far as the, uh, um, the, 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 the mitzvah itself, you'll find it constantly, the more you go through the Shas, Baruch Hashem, you're learning the Shas, you're going to run into it on a regular basis, especially once you go into uh, places like Masechet uh, Nida. There's entire sections about Masechet uh, Sanhedrin. There's an entire section about There's a few of them, Baruch Hashem, that have pretty big uh, explanations of different parts of it. Yeah. So, oh, no, go Can you think of a more difficult exercise in fortitude? More difficult exercise then? Oh, the protecting the bleed. There is nothing more difficult than the issues of Kedushah. That's what the Rambam writes. The, uh, the most difficult thing that a person can uh, overcome is this specific issue. Uh, because it's not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time thing. It's a lifelong thing. You know, if let's say somebody is addicted to overeating, or addicted to idolatry, or addicted to stealing, or addicted to fire, a kleptomaniac, or whatever other type of addiction that he has, those things usually, once you overcome them, more or less you're finished. More or less you're finished, perhaps you shouldn't go back to the bar anymore, perhaps you shouldn't hang out with those friends anymore, but more or less, out of sight is out of mind. 
with issues of morality, you don't need to see anything in order for you to think about it. You don't need to see anything in order for you to think about something wrong. You could be looking at your sidu and thinking about something that's not allowed. Why? Because again, it's, it's part of your yetzara. It's part of the yetzara. So this is why it makes it the, uh, the most difficult. But difficult doesn't mean impossible. Difficult means there's a big reward. A big reward, a very, very big reward, bigger than anything else that we, that we have. It's a Kadosh Baruch Hu's favorite mitzvah. It's another one of the ma'alot where he says that it's a Kadosh Baruch Hu's favorite mitzvah. In essence, it's the purpose of creation. So that's uh, a given. But nonetheless, this is something that he glorifies. Uh, he's glorified through because he says, look, the world exists because of him. The world, the world exists because of her. So imagine that, what happens in the heavens, I don't know, I don't have uh, maybe the imagination that somebody else has, but uh, uh, for a Kadosh Bechut to say, the world exists because of him, or the world exists because of her, I think it's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. Okay, I know that some of you have some personal issues you want to talk to me about, so I don't know if you guys want me to ask more questions. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. If you want to ask more questions, I'll answer more questions, but some of you guys actually want to have uh, something personal, and maybe it's getting too late for you, so if, if you prefer to do that, I'll do that. If you prefer to ask more questions, we'll continue with the questions. It's up to you. No one said anything, he's asking a question, so we'll answer the question. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Last question, and then we'll do the, uh, we'll do that. Two for one, same price. Uh, same price. About my question, you said uh, you might need to come back when a man picks a tikkun. Ken. Uh, how can, uh, like, Wait for your bleak behind until you're thirteen? Right. Uh, Who said that? Uh, oh, no. Okay, so the easy one is the second question about Brit Milan until you're 13. No, it's not allowed. The father is obligated to do a Brit Milan on his son at eight days old unless there is a life risk for him to do it. For example, if he had two other brothers that when they had Brit Milan at eight days old, they died, then you're not allowed to do a Brit Milan on him. Uh, you're not allowed to do on a third baby, you're not allowed to do Brit Milah because it already has chazakah that, uh, that there's a life risk for that family because they're weak in some way or another, so you don't do a Brit Milah on a third one. He could do for himself once he gets older, but the father is no longer obligated to do Brit Milah on the third one. But other than that, there's no other permission not to do Brit Milah. Uh, yes, do Brit Milah. And every single day that he doesn't do the Brit Milah, when he can do it, it's just considered a sin for the father. Now it starts becoming a sin for the son once the son is 13 years old. Once the son is 13 years old, every day he has no Brit Milah, it's considered a sin for him. It's considered a sin for him. This is also the reason why on the, on the uh, 13th birthday, uh, the, the father makes a blessing, blesses Hashem that uh, remove this burden for me. What's burden? The burden of his son because yet he was responsible for his son's sins, for his son's Brit and so on. So, but as far as to intentionally wait until a person's 13 years old, that's perhaps if he's Muslim, yes, but if he's Jewish, no. If he's Jewish, there's no permission whatsoever. The Muslims in the past used to wait until they're 13. Somebody told me recently that they don't do that anymore. They usually do it younger or sometimes uh, none, but uh, it's as far as uh, in the past, their tradition has been 13. For us, it's eight days. Why? That's the mitzvah that the Kaddosh gave Avraham Avinu. As far as what happens with a person if he reincarnates and he reincarnates and he doesn't know anything, what he knew the last time. Number one, that means that if you know now, do now. If you know now, do what you know now so you don't have to come back. Uh, number two, you know, this is also part of the consequence. The fact that he comes back to this world ignorant of what he knew in the previous generation is part of the tikkun. Is part of the tikkun. So it's part of the suffering. It's painful to learn everything new. Imagine you learned a, uh, you know, a, uh, a hundred books and chas v'shalom, you wake up one day and a uh, person uh, gets, uh, you know, I don't know, wakes up and he forgot everything. Imagine the suffering that he has, even if he's still alive. It's suffering, why you forgot everything? Actually, no, Talmit Chacham, Arab Zavichi, 
he had a uh, stroke twice, he, fight, he forgot his entire Torah twice. He forgot to know how to read and write twice. He forgot all of his Torah twice. And he learned it all over again. He learned it all over again, third time. Baruch Hashem, he has 120, he never forgets it again. But one interesting thing is that his midot were always good. Why? Because the midot become part of a person. So as far as knowledge and acquiring knowledge, that is, in essence, part of the punishment for a person to lose their knowledge. And a part of the gift, if a person uh, does tikkun, does uh, tshuva, Hashem gives him knowledge. That's why you'll see in every Gemara, the first, the inner, inner cover usually, will have a verses from uh, the part of the blessing that you say before you learn. And one of them says that Hashem gives knowledge. Hashem gives knowledge means that Torah that you learn, you learn from your effort part of it, but the vast majority of what you'll end up knowing is what Hashem gave you. Why did He give it to you? Due to your toil. The more you toil, the more you have mesirut nefesh and sacrifice for the sake of Torah, the more HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you. And that's the last thing I want to tell you guys. One of the things that the Arizal mentions and he brings from several places in regards to one of the benefits, one of the ultimate benefits of Brit Kodesh, especially ones that actually help other people do tshuva for it, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu opens up their mind for the Torah in, in so many words, supernatural ways where they know a whole lot more than they can possibly study. Uh, now again, these are not free gifts. You don't just go to a 7-Eleven and just become Bleed Kodesh overnight and all of a sudden you become Gdul Ado. But there are a whole list of rewards where if you knew everything that I have learned about this topic, probably all of you will be crying from happiness because you have a chance to achieve all of it. The fact that you guys are sound a little confused, that means you still don't understand what I'm talking about yet. So Bezot Hashem, you'll see a repeat of this you a few times until you guys start crying from happiness that you actually have a chance to attain everything I just said in this world, Bezot Hashem. Thank you very much for learning with me. HaKadosh Baruch bless each and every single one of you. Please take the books that are free over there, the, uh, the USBs, even if you don't need it for yourself. Give it to somebody. Give it to somebody. Take extra books, take extra USBs, all of them are free. Some of them are English, some of them are Hebrew. And at least do some Kiruv. At least pretend like you're doing Kiruv. Take some stuff over here so that people don't have to carry the books twice and take your mitzvot and do it themselves. School the mitzvot. הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שעלו ברכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן.